Chapter Eleven of Darkness and Daylight, or Lights and Shadows of New York Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Piotr Nater. Darkness and Daylight, or Lights and Shadows of New York Life. Chapter Eleven by Helen Campbell. Gospel Work in the Slums. An All Night Missionary's Life. A Midnight Curbstone Meeting, Abshin Bonali. An all-night missionary's life is full of strange experiences. Mr. Gibbot's faithful work in this capacity was unique, and from his store of reminiscences I give, in his own words, the following interesting incidents. A Midnight Curbstone Meeting Late one night I was pleading with a drunken man on the Bowery, while two friends stood waiting for me not far off. Suddenly I noticed one of a gang of thieves, who were lounging around the door of a low concert hall, leave his companions, approach my friends, and enter into conversation. I left my men and joined them. Seeing that I was the leader of the party, he addressed himself to me, suggesting that we try our hands at a game. "'My friend,' I said, "'I know you and your confidence game. I should think a man like you would want to be in some better business than swindling people.' It's mighty mean business, that of a thief, don't you think so? At first he was too much astonished to do anything but glare savagely at me. Then, recovering himself, he acted as though he was about to spring upon me. I laid my hand on his arm and gently said, You ought to be a Christian. He started back as though struck, but quickly recovered, and said with a sneer and in a loud voice, Me a Christian? Will Christ pay my rent? Will Christ feed me? Well, I said, I have seen a good many begin serving Christ without a cent or even a place to lay their heads, and I never knew one he let go down who was really in earnest. But see here, did you ever see Christ? No, but I expect to see him, and I have his word that I shall. Turning to his companions, he shouted, Come here, fellows, and see a chump who's got a promise of seeing Christ. We were standing under an electric light, it being long past midnight. Quite a number who were passing stopped, the thief's companions gathered round, and I soon found myself in the centre of a typical Bowery crowd, Jew and Gentile, a number of sporting men and thieves, two or three fallen women, several drunken men, and others attracted by the noise, eager to see what was going on. Again turning to his companions, the thief said in loud and jeering tones, Here's a fellow as is going to see Christ. Yes, I said, opening the Bible, I have his word for it. I will read it to you. Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Oh, you are a son of God, are you? he exclaimed contemptuously. Yes, and I have his word for that. Reading the Bible again, as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I was once far away from God, a great sinner, but I believed and received, and became his child. Well, brother, here's my hand. I'm a child of God, too, he said, winking at his companions. Oh, no, said I, don't call me brother, you don't belong to the Lord's family, ye are of your father the devil, and I read from Romans, know ye not to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, your regular business is to serve the devil, and you can't palm yourself off on me as one of God's family, but you may be adopted into his family if you will, then I read John 3.16, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. A man who had one of his ears nearly torn off in a fight, and whose head was bandaged so that only his eyes and mouth could be seen, said, You had better take a back seat, Bill, he's too much for you. Bill quickly turned with an angry oath and said, You'd better get out of this, or maybe you'll get a swipe across the other ear. There's nothing here for the likes of you, a man with only one ear. At this the crowd laughed, and guided the man with the bandaged head, who was quickly making his way out of the crowd, 
when I reached over and caught him by the shoulder and said, Hold on, my friend, there is something for you. And turning to Revelation, I read, He that hath an ear, let him hear. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life. The crowd laughed boisterously at this quotation, and I saw that I had their sympathy. So I gave them an invitation to attend the meetings at the mission, and after a few more words I closed by saying, We shall never all meet on earth again, but we shall each have to give an account of this curbstone meeting. May God bless every one of you. One rough fellow stepped forward with tears in his eyes and shook my hand heartily, saying, Stick to it, I wish I had. I was brought up right, in Sunday school and all, and if I had stuck to it, I wouldn't be what I am tonight. Just as he was going away, Bill came up and said, much to my surprise, You mustn't mind what I said. I've been a-drinking. I used to belong to the church and was a Christian, but I got off. I know it's the better way, but there's no good talking to me. It's no use. It's no use. After a few words with him, I left, praying God to bless the seed sown by the wayside. On the following Sunday evening, when I opened the meeting at the mission for testimony, one of Bill's companions got up and said, I have been a drinking man all my life, and have spent many years in prison. But last Thursday night, the man in the chair there came down near where I stay and talked about Christ, and I made up my mind to be a Christian and I haven't touched a drop of liquor since. When the invitation for prayers was given, the first one to come forward was Bill. For two nights, both of these men were present, Bill coming forward for prayers each night. Then I lost sight of them. Nearly six months passed, when Bill's companion, neatly dressed and greatly altered, came again to the mission room. He requested us to sing, All the way my Saviour leads me, what have I to ask beside? and followed it by saying, That is my experience. He then told us how God had kept and blessed him, and had given him employment. The inspector of police, who had so many times caused his arrest, had obtained work for him. He was often with us in the meetings after this, and became an earnest worker. One night he said to me, Do you remember Bill, the one who wanted to know if Christ would pay his rent? Yes. Well, the devil has paid his rent for life. He was sentenced for life last week, for shooting a bartender. Speaking of this incident at a convention, a nurse from one of the city hospitals inquired the time this occurred and said, I think I attended the man who had his ear injured. He came to the hospital and an operation was performed, but it was unsuccessful and he was obliged to come back again and have his ear entirely cut off. The man asked the surgeon if he could get a false ear. No, said the surgeon, you will have to go through life with one ear. Well, said the man, thank God I have heard of a book that says there is something for a man with one ear. So God blessed the seed, even though it seemed to fall on stony ground. Up Shinbone Alley by Night in dark and dirty Pell Street are many tumble-down tenements, most of them inhabited by Chinese, who run gambling dens and opium joints. On one side of the street there are a number of stables and several cheap lodging houses, where for five cents a night one can find shelter and a place to lay down. Halfway down the block, a narrow lane with the local name of Shinbone Alley runs in crescent shape round into the Bowery. This alley was the rendezvous of a gang of young thieves. Many a countryman, or Jack Tar, lured a few steps away from the glare of the Bowery into Shinbone Alley, has found himself suddenly surrounded by a crowd of desperate roughs, and before he was aware of it, lay on his back in the gutter, minus money, watch, and everything else the roughs could get hold of. The thieves vanished as swiftly as they came, and were in safe hiding in stables and dark hallways long before the victim recovered his senses. It was just three o'clock in the morning when I turned into the alley. Halfway through I stumbled over a beer keg, on which a lad was curled half asleep, who started up, but on seeing me, dropped back again, muttering, I thought it were a copper. In answer to the inquiry as to what he was doing there at that time of night, he replied briefly, Snoozin. He was a bright lad of twelve, 
a portion of an old straw hat hid his dirty sleepy face an old vest several sizes too large covered a soiled and greasy calico shirt his pants were a mass of rags and patches tied together with numerous strings his feet were covered with dirt thick enough to answer the purpose of stockings i entered into conversation by asking his name and what he did for a living he replied in a true bowery dialect me name's dutchy i shines sells papers and works the growler for the gang what's the growler i asked don't you know he replied looking at me in undisguised contempt the growler why that's the pail they gets the beer and when the gang's in luck i gets only the froth we was out to-night and took in the theatre theater, and i was barred out of the house and was snoozing when you come along the lad interested me i wanted to learn his story i was turning over in my mind how best to handle him when my attention was drawn to an old covered wagon directly in front of us inside of which a conversation was being carried on in low tones noticing my look of inquiry that she said it's some of the gang in a moment a lank typical rough got out of the wagon staggered over to where i sat and in a gruff voice said what's the time boss glancing at my watch pocket as though he cared more to see the timepiece than to know the time he seemed disappointed when i told him i had no watch with me he returned to the wagon and began conversation again with those inside i learned from dutchy that this individual was corky and that he had just returned from doing time up the river a term in sing sing prison dutchy was now called over to the gang and joined in the whispered consultation listening intently i was convinced from the few words that reached me that they were planning to rob me and i realized that i had fallen among thieves praying for wisdom to adopt the best course i awaited developments in a few moments the roughs to the number of eight or ten got out of the wagon and gathered round me one evidently the leader advanced nearer than the rest and said sulkily boss we want you to give us five cents till we get a pint of beer to wash the cobwebs from our throats the time for action had come i said see here boys i want to give you a bit of good advice when you plan to rob anyone never pick out a missionary for they are always as poor as a church mouse and never have anything worth stealing now i am a missionary so i can save you the trouble of going through my clothes there is not a thing in them worth the taking they stood speechless and i continued boys i knew what you were up to but instead of your catching me i have caught you without giving them a chance to say anything i told them the story of the cross and how christ in the agonies of death stopped to save a dying thief and took him as a companion to paradise and how if there was salvation for a dying thief there was certainly a chance for a living one if they would only come to the same saviour i urged them to quit their life of sin and follow christ not one of them spoke a word when i turned to go away i said boys i want you to remember me the next time you see me will you do it corky spoke up and said well i'm blowed i've been around these corners for the last seven years and you're the first one i ever seed round here preaching religion you can bet your bottom dollar i won't forget your fizz one of this gang not long after to escape a detective ran into the mission meeting and to use his own words was caught by the great detective and kept from stealing and everything else that was wicked and bad End of chapter 11、chapter、12 of darkness and daylight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by april 6090 Darkness and Daylight, or Lights and Shadows of New York Life, Chapter Twelve, by Helen Campbell. Shop girls and working women, the Great Army, New York poor, life under the Great Bridge, the bitter cry of New York. A quarter of a million women, and this exclusive of domestic service, three hundred and forty-three trades open to them, and each one thronged with eager learners. 
This is the beginning of the story of New York working women, and day by day the number grows. What the 340 trades specified in the last United States Labor Bureau report are, no man knows, save only the census taker and the newspaper reporter, who must know all things. Many of them are simply subdivisions of old trades, which include many processes, each one so thoroughly separated from all the rest as to form a trade in itself. Whatever they are, and however the little reward the knowledge of their intricacies may bring, it is certain that a row of applicants are always in waiting, and that an advertisement for one often brings a hundred. Before sketching the life of the worker in trades of all orders, let us see how it fares with the shop girl. Often she begins as a cash girl, leaving school at twelve or thirteen, and making one of the long list of applicants always on file in the great retail dry goods establishments. It is a favorite ambition with the public school girl from the better class of tenement house, where one finds chiefly Irish and Germans. The children are quick and bright, apt to be ready reckoners, and look up upon the great stores as the high road to fortune that she must be on her feet most of the day and work for a dollar fifty or at most two dollars a week and may not be counted worth more than this for two or three years does not deter hundreds from applying if any vacancy occurs certain things are learned that at home would probably have been impossible they find that punctuality is the first essential learning the lesson perhaps through the fines over which they cry to them nothing can be better than to be a full-fledged sales lady and it may be even in time the head of a department if wages are a pittance hours exhausting and an army always waiting to fill their places if they in any way forfeit them the fact of companionship and of the constant interest and excitement of watching the throng in shop and street seems sufficient to satisfy all longings and prevent much complaint their quickness and aptness to learn their honesty and general faithfulness and their cheapness are essentials in their work and to this combination of qualities cheapness dominating all has given them a permanent place in the modern system of trade the shop girl has no thought of permanence for herself. The cheaper daily papers record in fullest detail the doings of that fashionable world toward which many a weak girl or woman looks with unspeakable longing, and the weekly story papers feed the flame with details of the rich marriage that lifted the poor girl into the luxury which stands to her empty mind as the sole thing to be desired in earth or heaven. Hope is strong. She expects to marry. And in many a silly little head, there is hidden away the conviction that it will probably be some rich and handsome customer who will woo her over the counter to the admiration and desperation of all the other girls and place her at once where she really belongs. She knows far better what constitutes the life of the rich than the rich ever know of the life of the poor. From her post behind the counter, the shop girl examines every detail of costume, every air and grace, of the women she so often despises, even when longing to be one of them. She imitates where she can, and her cheap shoe has its French heel, her neck its tin dog collar. Gilt rings, bracelets, and bangles, frizzes, bangs, and cheap trimmings of every order swallow up her earnings. The imitation is often more effective than the real and the girl knows it. She aspires to a manicure, set to an opera glass, to anything that will simulate the life daily paraded before her and most passionately desire. In the early morning she hurries to her place behind the counter. There are heavy boxes to lift down and arrange an order before the rush of business begins, and even before the clerks are ready to receive their customers begin to arrive. The breakfast of weak coffee and baker's bread has given her no strength. She is tired before she begins, and she grows more tired as the morning goes on, and a hundred demands are made upon her. 
it is her business to be bright and smile and take an interest in every quarter of a yard of ribbon that comes in to be matched the crowds fill the aisles she must answer questions as to the locations of other departments put aside packages for customers for just a moment take care of their change while they go to another counter keep her eyes open for pickpockets make constant calculations of quantities and prices and through it all hurry 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 keeping her temper and a smiling face lunchtime at last that precious half hour when she can sit down on a hard bench and rest deliciously and eat a roll and some baker's dry cookies brought from home with an intense longing for a cup of hot coffee or tea at night how her feet ache and her back and her head as she climbs the stairs of a tenement house oftentimes to find her father growling and grumbling as he comes out from a drunken sleep the shopper on her busy rounds for bargains comes at last to think of the shop girl as simply a machine for taking down boxes with an occasional tendency to impertinence and a certain one to overdressing headache or heartache tired or sick it is all one to the buyer who if she pauses for a moment to notice a specially pretty or possibly troubled face turns away with the vague sense that this is an order of which she knows nothing a gulf as wide as that between dives and lazarus divides the rich customer from the girl who watches every detail of dress movement and mode of speaking and forms her own conclusions as to the real status of the buyer neither understands the other until the day of working girls clubs a creation of the last few years understanding was impossible my counter is down in the basement said a shop girl to me and there are forty others like me besides about forty little girls there is gas and electric light both but there isn't a breath of air and it's so hot that after an hour or two your head feels baked and your eyes as if they would fall out the dull season that is from spring to fall lasts six months and then we work nine and a half hours and saturdays thirteen the other six months we work eleven hours and during holiday time till ten and eleven o'clock at night we have to put on blue glasses the glare of the electric light is so dreadful but they don't like to have us do it the only comfort is you're with a lot of others and don't feel lonesome i can't bear to do anything alone no matter what it is said another i hope there's purgatory at least for some of the people i've had to submit to i think a woman manager is worse than a man just take the new superintendent we loved the old one but this one came in when she died and one of the first things she did was to discharge one of the old girls because she didn't smile enough good reason why she'd lost her mother the week before and wasn't likely to feel much like smiling then the floor walker poked under the counters and shelves with a stick and routed out all the old shoes we had tucked away that were such a rest to our feet which often swell until moving is torture it most kills you to stand all day in new shoes but the floor walker pitched all the old ones out and said he wasn't going to have the store turned into an old shoe shop the average day of the average shop girl is a monotonous round of labor when jim who is only a bowery boy who sells misfit trousers and gentlemen's furnishings in a cheap clothing store invites her to a ball patronized by numberless girls and boys of their order who shall blame the shop girl for snatching at this bit of brightness and for a little while fancying herself rich and all the other good things that grace the heroines in the story papers there are tragedies that might be told but we will not let them enter here vain silly light-headed hard-working good-hearted little workers they will squabble diligently with their neighbor at the counter and then sit up nights with her if she is ill and even go without their beloved chewing gum in order to buy her some little luxury and so the world goes on and a shop girl's day remains unchanged the story of one being the story of all the thousands who fill this role until the scene shifts and fresh actors are on the stage and what about the workers in trades why are they at work there are as many motives as trades for the most part the answer is simple 
they must earn, because there is no one to earn for them, and this is the great majority. Outside of this army is another, the large class of women, already provided for in homes of their own, but who want more pin money and hosts of married women who want means for more stylish living or dress, and who work at home to accomplish this very end, often underbidding their poorer sisters by working at half price or even less. With them we have nothing to do. It is the life of the average working woman wholly dependent on her own resources that we must know. Its struggles, its resources, its outlook as a whole. Naturally, the great mass are needlewomen of all orders. It is this one employment toward which every woman left to fight her own battle turns instinctively, unless she has had a training that fits her for something better. Either she enters a factory, where the intelligence demanded is of the lowest order, as in bag-making and kindred industries, or she takes home slop-work of all sorts, from overalls and jumpers to coarser or finer work. For such work a sewing machine must be owned, and as to get one even on installments is often quite beyond the power of the worker. This fact is taken advantage of by numbers of sweaters who rent cellars, called by courtesy basements, and act as middlemen, taking the work in great packages from the cutter of the manufacturing house, and paying the women so much a dozen for the work done. The making of underclothing and cheap jackets and cloaks is managed in the same way. Everything, in short, that makes up the cheaper forms of clothing falls largely into the hands of these middlemen and often the women prefer this form of employment, since working with numbers has a more exhilarating effect than the same task alone, and heat and machine are both furnished. But every order of work goes on also in the tenement houses, where the woman who owns a machine can take work direct from the factory. The division of labor, which is one of the marked features of all modern work, rules here no less than elsewhere. Many a woman spends month after month in stitching, fells till she has acquired a purely mechanical accuracy, who could by no possibility either cut, fit, or make an entire garment. There is always a dearth of trained seamstresses, who understand all forms of sewing, and for whom there is a demand that is yet to be fully met. There is another class, helpless through no fault of theirs, though often powerless through lack of training. It is the hundreds, yes thousands, of women, widows, or worse than widows, who must care for little children often more fortunate without a father than with one. Drunken husbands who not only furnish nothing toward the family support, but demand support themselves, are worked for with a patience that is a constant miracle to all who watch. Sewing in some of its myriad forms is the first thought and often in the wretched dens of these downtown tenements one sees embroideries, destined for happy children, in sunny homes, or rich cloaks whose velvet and silk seem a mockery. Poverty is not infectious, yet strange germs go with the garments into which these women have stitched all the want and pain born of hunger and cold and nakedness, of endurance and final despair. The sewing machine is seen at every hand, no tenement being too foul for the unhappy creatures who must earn or starve. And this enormous proportion of workers with the needle is one of the saddest facts to be faced by the explorer in these regions. The investigation made by the State Bureau of Labor in 1885, which took form in a report accessible to all, records women working on gingham waste for boys at two and a half cents each it being impossible to make more than a dozen in fourteen hours at the machine. At the office of the Women's Protective Union, its head, who has been familiar with all phases of this work for thirty years, said that many workers on their books earned but twenty-five to fifty cents a day. Cloakmakers generally earn from sixty to seventy cents a day, but even this means comfort and profusion compared with the facts that were revealed in a fourth ward rookery. Here an old wooden house given over to the lowest uses, in a room ten feet square, low-sealed, and lighted only by a single window, 
whose panes were crusted with the dirt of a generation. Seven women sat at work. Three machines were the principal furniture. A small stove burned fiercely, the close smell of red-hot iron hardly dominating the fouler one of sinks and reeking sewer gas. Piles of cloaks were on the floor, and the women, white and wan, with cavernous eyes and hands more akin to a skeleton's than to flesh and blood, bent over the garments that would pass from this loathsome place saturated with the inevitable filth furnished as air. They were handsome cloaks, lined with quilted silk or satin, trimmed with fur or sealskin, and retailing at prices from thirty to seventy-five dollars. A teapot stood at the back of the stove, some cups and a loaf of bread, with a lump of streaky butter, were on a small table, absorbing their portion also of filth. In a new room, a mere closet, dark and even fouler than the outer one, held the bed, a mattress, black with age, lying on the floor. Here, such rest as might be, had was taken when the sixteen hours of work ended, sixteen hours of toil unrelieved by one gleam of hope or cheer, the net result of this accumulated and ever-accumulating misery being three dollars and fifty cents a week. Two women using their utmost diligence could finish one cloak per day, receiving from the sweater through whose hands all work must come, fifty cents each for a toil unequaled by any form of labor under the sun, unless it be that of the haggard wretches, dressed in men's clothes but counted as female laborers in Belgian mines. They cannot stop, they dare not stop, to think of other methods of earning. They are what is left of untrained, hopelessly ignorant lives, clinging to these lives with a tenacity hardly higher in intelligence than that of the limpet on the rock but turning to one with lustreless eyes and blank faces, asking only the one question, Lord, how long? I recall words spoken to me by a worker in whose life hope was dead. I've worked eleven years, she said. I've tried five trades with my needle and machine. My shortest day has been fourteen hours, for I had the children and they had to be fed. There's not one of these trades that I don't know well. It isn't work that I have any trouble in getting. It's wages. Five years ago I could earn a dollar and a half a day, and we were comfortable. Then it began to go down, a dollar and a quarter, then a dollar. There it stopped a while, and I got used to that, and could even get some remains of comfort out of it. I had to plan to the last half cent. We went cold often, but we were never hungry. But then it fell again to ninety cents, to eighty-five. For a year, the best that I can do, I have earned not over eighty cents a day, sometimes only seventy-five. I'm sixty-two years old. I can't learn new ways. I'm strong. I always was strong. I run the machine fourteen hours a day with just the stoppings that have to be made to get the work ready. I've never asked a man alive for a penny beyond what my own hands can earn, and I don't want it. I suppose the Lord knows what it all means. It's his world and his children in it. And I've kept myself from going crazy many a time by saying it was his world, and that somehow it must all come right in the end. But I don't believe it any more. He's forgotten. There's nothing left but men that live to grind the faces of the poor, that chuckle when they find a new way of making a cent or two more a week out of starving women and children. I never thought I should feel so. I don't know myself. But I tell you I'm ready for murder when I think of these men. If there's no justice above, it isn't quite dead below. And if men with money will not heed, the men and the women without money will rise some day. How? I don't know. We've no time to plan, and we're too tired to think. But it's coming. Somehow. And I'm not ashamed to say I'll join in if I live to see it come. It's seas of tears that these men sail on. It's our life blood they drink, and our flesh that they eat. How do they live on such earnings? Live is hardly the word. Tea is their chief dependence, boiled to extract the last atom of strength. This with baker's bread, most often butterless, is their food and that of such children as may be theirs to support. 
All coal is brought by the scuttle, a scuttle of medium-sized counting, as twelve cents worth, thus much more than doubling the cost per ton. Wood by the bundle and oil by the quart give the utmost margin of profit to the seller, and the same fact applies to all provisions sold. In no case save one where the mother had learned that cabbage water can form the basis for a nourishing and very palatable soup. Was there the faintest gleam of understanding that the same amount of money could furnish a more varied, more savory, and more nourishing regimen? That the knowledge of cheap and savory preparation of food would soon have its effect on the percentage of drunkards no one can question. Take the case of a laboring man among the lower classes, with a family to provide for. What does daily bread mean to him? Minute knowledge of this sort must come from patient waiting and watching as one can, rather than from any systemized observation. The poor resent bitterly and with justice any apparent interference or spying, and only as one comes to know them well can anything but the most outside details of their life be obtained. In the matter of food, there is an especial touchiness and testiness, every woman being convinced that to cook well is the birthright of all women. I have found the same conviction as solidly implanted in far higher grades of society, and it may be classed as one of the most firmly seated of popular delusions that every woman keeps houses instinctively and surely when her time comes as a duck takes to water. Such was the faith of Nora Boylan, tenant of half the third floor in a tenement house, six stories high, and swarming from basement to attic. Forty children, making it hideous with the screaming and wrangling of incessant fights, while in over all rested the penetrating, sickening, tenement house smell, not to be drowned by steam of washing or scent of food. Nora's tongue was ready with the complaint of hard times, and she faced me now with hands on her hips and a generally belligerent expression. And sure, ma'am, you know yourself, tis only a dollar a day. He's been earning this many a day, and thankful enough to get that. Would Mike, overheard wearing his tongue out, would ask him for work here and there and everywhere, and how we live on that, and the rent do regular, and the spleen of an agent popping in his ugly face and off with the bed o' money, no matter how bare the dishes. Bad says to him, says I, and I'd like to have him hungered once and know how it feels. Sure, and if I hadn't the washing, we'd be on the street this day. What do you live on, Nora? Is it live, do ye say? Then I could hardly tell. It's mate and Patey's and Tay and Pat will have his glass. He's sober enough, not like Mike above. That's off in his sprees every month. But now we don't be getting the same as we used. Pat says there's that bad craving in him that only the whiskey'll stop. It's ten dollars a month rent for the rooms, and that's two and a half a week steady. And there's only seventeen and a half left for the five mouths that must be fed. And the fire and all. For I can't get more than four dollars for me washing. It's the mate. Ye must have to put strength in, ye. And Pat would be having it three times a day. And now it's but once he can. And that's why he's after the whiskey to stop the craving. The tilder and meself has mostly tie. And it all that caps us up. Sometimes we has a mate. But not often. God knows. How do you cook your meat, Nora? Nora looked at me suspiciously. Sure, the bit we get don't take long. I puts it in the pan and lets till fry till we're ready. Poor folks can't have much roasting nor fine doings. And by that token, it's time it was on now. If you don't mind, ma'am, the children will be in from school. And they must eat and get back. I'm going in a few moments, Nora. Go right on. Nora moved aside her clothes boiler, drew a frying pan from her closet put a lump of yellow fat, and laid in a piece of coarse beef, some two pounds in weight. A loaf of bread came next, and was cut up, 
its peculiar white color indicating plainly what share alum had had in making the lightness to which she called my attention a handful of tea went into the tall tin teapot which is filled from the kettle at the back of the stove that isn't boiling water is it i ventured ouch sure it'll boil fast enough neither fear nora answered indifferently as she pulled open the draughts and soon had the top of the stove red hot the steak lay in its bed of fat scorching peacefully while the tea boiled giving off a rank and herby smell pat doesn't get home to dinner then nora there's times he does but mostly not he likes a hot bite and sup but it's too far off there's five men goes from this floor together and a pailful for each bread and coffee mostly and a bit o bacon for some it's a hot supper i used to be getting him but the times is too hard and we're lucky if we can have our tie and bread and molasses maybe for the children many the days i wish meself back in old ireland as she talked the children came rushing up the stairs pale-faced and slender and i took my leave burning to speak yet knowing it useless fried boot hill would have been as nourishing and as toothsome as that steak and boiled boot heel as desirable and far less harmful a drink than the tea yet any word of suggestion would have roused the quick irish temper to fever heat it's nora can cook equal to yourself she once exclaimed to me with pride as she emptied a black and smoking mass into a dish and those methods certainly cannot be said to be difficult to follow the wives and mothers among the lower laboring classes have usually in their younger days been servants and still go out to day's work but no matter now numerous the family such life for any daughter is despised and discouraged from the beginning work in a bag factory or any one of the thousand but to the employees profitless industries of a great city is eagerly sought and hardships cheerfully endured which if enforced by a mistress would lead to riot to be a shop girl seems the highest ambition to have dress and hair and expression a frowsy a pitiful copy of the latest fifth avenue ridiculousness to flirt with shop boys as feeble-minded and brainless as themselves and to marry as quickly as possible are the aims of all then come more wretched thriftless ill-managed homes and their natural results in drunken husbands and vicious children and so the round goes on the circle widening year by year till its circumference touches every class in society and would make our great cities almost what sober country folk believe them seas of inequity philanthropists may urge what reforms they will less crowding purer air better sanitary regulations but this question of food underlies all a food easily procured sufficiently palatable to ensure no dissatisfaction and demanding no ingenuity of preparation would seem the ideal diet of the poor if they could be made to adopt it beans said one indignant soul what time have i to think of beans or what money to buy coal to cook em what you'd want if you sat over a machine fourteen hours a day would be tea like lye to put a backbone in you that's why we have tea always in the pot and it don't make much odds what's with it a slice of bread is about all once in a while you get ragin' tearin' hungry seems as if you'd swallow a teapot or anything handy to fill up life but that ain't often lucky for us a grade beyond them is hardly in better condition and straight through the long list of those who use the needle it is much the same story when you sat all day at the machine you don't want much said one a little english woman whose husband after a year or two of wife beating and the other indulgences of a free-born englishman inclined to a drop too much had fortunately for her been killed in a drunken brawl tea do artin you up a bit and make you fitter to go on and that's what we must have if we're to work fourteen hours steady a bit of bread with it and you can do very well though it's art on the children this is the lowest depth 
above it as to intelligence let us take a mother and daughter the latter a stitcher of corset covers and fine night dresses and the mother incapacitated by rheumatism from much more than basting and finishing both had known better days the saddest of formulas and when these suddenly ended there came a period of bewildered helplessness in which the widow felt that respectability like hers must know no compromise and that any step would involve her being talked about was a step toward destruction she must live on a decent street in a house where she need not be ashamed to have her relations come and she did till earnings had lessened from a dollar and a half to eighty-five cents a day on which the two must live far over toward the north river on the first floor of a great tenement house inhabited chiefly by the better class of irish she took two rooms one a mere closet where the bed could stand bestowed in them such furniture as remained and at fifty with no clue left that any friend could trace began the fight for bread the mother watched every penny of the poor little earnings and extracted all the comfort that lay in their compass she had kept an account of their weekly expenses and allowed me to run over the items i have to see where the money goes to she said apologetically else i should get clean distracted thinking that i might have saved a penny here or a penny there now here is last month twenty-seven working days and that makes twenty two dollars and ninety five cents out of that had to come ten dollars for rent we lay that aside every week and never touch it whatever happens because that is to keep us from being put out on the street now you see there is twelve dollars and ninety five cents left for provisions and coal and light and clothes how do you suppose we do it for it isn't much for two people now is it we've a little oil stove that saves coal for i boil the kettle on it and cook bits of things soup for one for we found soup was very nourishing and cheaper than meat we only have a bit of meat once a week or so i used to miss it but now i don't mind this is the list just as i put it down sugar twenty three cents tomatoes seven cents potatoes five cents tea fifteen cents butter thirty cents bread twelve cents coal twelve cents milk fifteen cents clams ten cents forward a dollar twenty nine brought up a dollar twenty nine oil fifteen cents newspaper one cent clams ten cents potatoes five cents cabbage five cents bread seven cents flour fifteen cents rolls three cents total a dollar ninety this week was an expensive one a little more so than usual because i bought a whole pound of butter once but then it will last well into next week sharpening the scissors too took five cents but then we made that up in not having to get kindling for a neighbor's boy brought us some nice bits from the building down the street i tried to save on the food but i can't seem to get it less than twelve cents a day apiece do what i will so that is seven dollars forty four cents a month and that leaves five dollars and fifty one cents and out of that come car fares when emmy has to go downtown last month it took sixty cents a week for them and then emmy had to have shoes a dollar fifty so you see there wasn't much margin i might leave out the paper but we do want to see one once in a while last month emmy got two remnants for a dollar eighty and i made her a dress that looked very well but both of us underneath are nothing but patchwork then we have to have soap and all that for the washing and coal coal is the worst thing for it costs twelve cents a scuttle and i'm always trying to get ahead enough to buy a quarter of a ton at once but can't there's a place here to keep it but none of us in the house ever earn enough to put anything in it we earn a little enough but wages are going lower and lower seems to me and where will they stop the lord only knows this is untrained labor and thus more helpless than those 
who have been taught a regular trade but it represents a large portion of new york's working women when the great bridge always written with a capital letter to signify how far it is beyond and above all other bridges yet produced was outlined in the final plan which doomed every building on the site of its great piers to destruction dover street at the end nearest franklin square found itself almost wiped out such houses as remained were left in shadow and most of all these nearest to the towering piers under the great bridge stands a tenement house so shadowed by the vast structure that save at midday natural light barely penetrates it sunshine has no place in these rooms which no enforced laws have made decent and where occasional individual effort has small power against the unspeakable filth ruling in intangible and intangible forms sink and sewer and closet uniting in a common and all-pervading stench the chance visitor has sometimes to rush to the outer air deathly sick and faint at even a breath of this noisomeness the most determined one seems inclined to burn every garment worn during such quest the house had been dark before but little by little as the blocks of granite were put into place and the great pier grew the sunshine vanished and seeing at all save by gaslight was well nigh impossible only at midday could the sun's rays find entrance at any point and it grew worse rather than better as the forlorn women who do washing for the offices in the business streets close at hand strung their lines of towels in the vain hope that the sun would dry and air sweeten them there's a good time for us at last said one of the tenants when this had gone on for months we've light enough now thank god and one that'll stay i'm thinking it has stayed all night long the glare of street and bridge electric lights cold and blinding is on every foot of the space below and their rays are the substitute for sunshine shut out once for all from these dismal rooms till the pier falls as the inhabitants pray sometimes that it may with small thought that their own destruction would be equally certain in this tenement house the day's work has ceased to be the day's work for honest or thieving all alike do their allotted work by night and sleep by day the women who cannot afford the gas or oil that must burn if they work in the daytime sleep while day lasts and when night comes and the searching rays of the electric light penetrate every corner their shadowy rooms turn to the toil by which their bread is won heavy-eyed women toil at the washboard or run the sewing machine and when sunrise has come and the east river and the beautiful harbor are aflame with color the light for these dwellings is extinguished and their night begins i used to look at the big stones of the pier swinging into place said one of the workers on the top floor a trousers stitcher and finisher but i never thought what they would do in the end it got a little darker and a little darker and at last it was more than i could do to see so we were all glad enough to have the electric light shine into our rooms though it's blinding and sort of hard and we would like to see the sun once in a while but i go out for that and it's better than nothing in one of these rooms clean if cleanliness were possible were walls and ceiling in every plank and beam reek with the foulness from sewer and closet three women were at work on overalls two machines were placed directly under the windows to obtain every ray of light a small stove the inevitable teapot steaming at the back a table with cups and saucers and a loaf of bread still uncut and a small dresser in one corner in which a few dishes were ranged completed the furniture a sickly geranium grew in an old tomato can but save for this no attempt of adornment of any sort had been made in this respect it differed from other rooms in the same rookery in some of which cheap colored prints were pinned up and in one room one side had been decorated with all the trademarks peeled from the goods on which the family worked 
but in the dismal room occupied by the three overall makers there was no time for even such attempts at betterment the machines ran on as i talked with the workers with only a momentary pause as interest deepened and one woman nodded confirmation to the statement of another you see we all live together now one of the women said as her fingers flew over the coarse button holes she was making in the waistband and flaps of some overalls we each had a room to ourselves for all of us as widows that had children to mind but the fever took them all but one that's out selling papers and so we put our heads together at last and said we'd be more sensible if we clubbed machines and all you'd think we'd move to a better place but we're never ahead enough to pay for moving even our bits of things and perhaps you won't believe it but we're used to this and hate to change i've had a better one and good furniture once for my husband was mate on a tug and earned first rate but he took to drink and sold everything bit by bit and always getting worse and worse till at last he got hurt in a fight and died next day in hospital I went into a necktie place on Allen Street for a while. Mary over there was there too. Her husband was a bricklayer and got good wages, but he went with drink too, and so did Hannah's. We knew all about it, all of us. This is cheap rent. We pay five dollars a month, and if it was lighter and we didn't have to have such smells, we would do very well. Overalls are up now. Though why? The Lord only knows or why they go up and then go down but we get a dollar and a dozen on these and i can do ten a day and have done a dozen by working fourteen hours it needs a heavy machine and they do take the backbone out of one the other woman nodded it was plain that they held the same conviction you sleep like the dead when you're through that's one comfort she went on it wouldn't be so bad if they weren't always cutting under you I learned my trade of tailoring regularly, as soon as I found Tim wouldn't be any dependents, and was going to send the children to school and keep things decent. But then came the German women, offering to do work at half the rate, and then the Italians, and the Polish Jews, that don't mind living like pigs, and that ended it. With all the cuts, I don't see how anybody keeps soul and body together. We don't, one of the women said, turning suddenly. I got rid of my soul long ago, such as twas. Who's got time to think about souls, grinding away here fourteen hours a day to turn out contract goods? Taint souls that count, it's bodies that can be driven, and half starved and driven still, till they drop in their tracks. I'd try the river if I wasn't driving to pay a doctor's bill for my three that went with the fever. Before that, I was driving to put food into their mouths. I never owed a cent to no man. I've been honest and paid as I went, and done a good turn when I could. If I'd chosen the other thing while I'd a pretty face of my own, I'd a had ease and comfort and a quick death. The river's the best place I'm thinking, for them that wants ease. Such life as this isn't living. You don't mean it the first speaker said apologetically. She knows there's better times ahead. Yes, the kind you'll find in the next room. Take a look in there, ma'am, and then tell me what we're going to do. One look into the dark fireless room was enough. A pantaloon maker sat there, huddled in an old shawl and finishing the last of a dozen, which, when taken back, would give her money for fire and food. She'd been ill for three days. The bed was an old mattress on a dry goods box in the corner, and, save for the chair on which she sat, and the stove, the room was empty. Even that, she said, with a glance at the miserable bed, is more than I had for a good while. I pawned everything before my husband died, except the machine. I couldn't make but twenty-two cents a pair on the pants, and as long as he could hold up, he did the pressing. With him to help a little, I made three pair a day. That seems a little, but there was so many pieces to each pair. Side and watch and pistol, pockets, buckle strap, waistband, and bottom facings and lap. Six buttonholes and nine buttons. 
We lived. I don't know just how we lived. He was going in consumption and very set about it. I'll have no medicine and no doctor to make me hang and drag along, he says. I've got to go, and I know it, and I'll do it as fast as I can. He was scotch, and he took his porridge to the last. But I came to loathe the sight of it. He could live on six cents a day. I couldn't. I'm the kind for your contractors, he'd say. It's a glorious country, and the rich'll be richer yet, when there's more like me. He didn't mind what he said, and when a Bible reader put her head in one day, Come in, he says. My wife's working for a Christian contractor at sixty-six cents a day, and I'm what's left of another Christian's dealings with me, keeping me as a packer in a damp basement and no fire. Come in, and let's see what your Christianity has to say about it. He scared her. His eyes were so shiny, and he most gone then. But there's many a one that doesn't go over fifty cents a week for what she'll eat. God help them, that's starving us all by bits. If there is a God, and I'm doubting it. Else why don't things get better, and not always worse and worse? Outside of the army of needlewomen came the washers and ironers, who laundry shirts and underwear, whose work is of the most exhausting order, who lean hard on the iron and in time become the victims of diseases resulting from ten hours a day of this, leaning hard, and who complain bitterly that prisons and reformatories underbid them and keep wages down. It is quite true, convict labor, here as elsewhere, is the foe of the earnest worker, and complicates a problem already sufficiently complicated. There is a constantly increasing army of scrub women who clean the floors of offices, and public buildings at night for a pittance, whose life is of the hardest. However, conditions might differ. The final word was always the same, and it stands as the summary of the life that is lived from day to day by these workers, never better, always worse and worse. The shadow of the great pier seems the natural home of these souls, who have forgotten sunshine and lost hope and faith in anything better to come. It lingers here and there. It looked from the steady eyes of some of those workers who smiled a wan smile at the memory of old brightness. It lingers in many a patient face bending over weary seams and waiting for a better day to come. Will it come and when? I turn at last from these women whose eyes still follow me, filled with mute questions on what can be done of all ages and nations and creeds, of all degrees of ignorance and prejudice and stupidity, hampered by every condition of birth and training, powerless to rise beyond them till obstacles are removed. The great city holds them all. The great foul city, rattling, growling, smoking, stinking, a ghastly heap of fermenting brickwork, pouring out poison at every pore. We packed the poor away in tenements, crowded and foul beyond anything known even to London, whose bitter cry had less reason than ours. And we have taken excellent care that no foot of ground shall remain that might mean breathing space, or free sport of child, or any green growing thing. Grass pushes its way here and there, but for this army of weary workers, it is only something that at last they may lie under, never upon. There is no pause in the march, where, as one and another drops out, the gap fills instantly, every alley and byway holding unending substitutes. It is not labor that profiteth, for body and soul are alike starved. It is labor in its basest, most degrading form, labor that is a curse and never a blessing as true work may be and is. It blinds the eyes, it steals away joy. It blunts all power, whether of hope or faith. It wrecks the body and it starves the soul. It is waste and only waste, nor can it be low ground or above. Hold fructifying power for any human soul. It is as student, not as professional philanthropist, that I write and the years that have brought experience have also brought a conviction, sharpened by every fresh series of facts, that no words, no matter what fire of fever, 
may lie behind can make plain the sorrow of the poor end of section fourteen chapter twelve chapter thirteen of darkness and daylight or lights and shadows of new york life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by greg giordano darkness and daylight or lights and shadows of new york chapter thirteen by helen campbell hospital life in new york a tour through the wards of old bellevue affecting scenes the morgue and its silent occupants the wayfarer on fifth avenue passing through miles of stately homes fashionable churches great club-houses and all that exhibits the most lavish expenditure of wealth for personal enjoyment comes suddenly upon a spot which in an instant recalls the fact that under all this pomp of external life suffering and want still hold their place not a stone's throw from the avenue and its brilliant life one passes through the always open gates of st luke's hospital under the shadow of great trees whose friendly protecting branches are welcome and greeting for all alike flowers bloom here as brightly as if pain had no place impertinent sparrows swarm and chatter under the eaves and perching on window sills or frames look in with curious eyes on the long lines of cots within are broad corridors high ceilings and great windows a flood of sunshine is there and the freshest of air blows straight from the sea a cleanliness that is spotless quiet purity efficient ministration form the atmosphere of this famous hospital the name of which has become a synonym for the tenderest care that strangers can give to strangers bellevue st luke's the new york hospital and two or three others less widely known are the names that generally occur when any question arises as to the hospital system of new york year by year the list of special and general large and small sectarian and unsectarian hospitals has lengthened till to-day it numbers nearly one hundred and fifty methods vary but little and each is eager to include the latest and best in its management thousands of medical students not only from all parts of america but from the world at large come to new york hospitals to study the cases that daily pass under the surgeon's hands the medical colleges look upon them as training schools and each of the larger hospitals is not only its clinics for medical students both men and women but training schools for nurses the numbers of whom are steadily increasing but it is the life within these walls that most concerns us and we will seek it at old bellevue as the victims of sudden accident often must every saunterer in city streets knows the sudden thrill of excitement and wonder as the gong of the fire engine sounds and the magnificent horses rush by straining every nerve in their haste to be on the needed spot there is another gong no less startling and imperative that of the ambulance dead black as to color swift and furious as to progress its arrival at bellevue is of hourly occurrence and excites no comment from officials or attendants victims of accidents of all kinds and patients of all degrees are constantly arriving at its doors the call for an ambulance is generally sent to the hospital through the telephone and is at once transmitted by signal bells to the surgeon's office and the stables two bells is the signal for an ordinary call five if haste is necessary and twelve for a summons so fire or falling walls in lurid flame so often do their deadly work 
The response is a quick one in any case, but for the hurry call, the speed is so mad that it is difficult to keep one's place in the ambulance at all. A surgeon is always on duty to answer calls, and the one who is detailed for an ambulance trip may respond bareheaded, barefooted, and half-dressed, finishing his toilet as he is whirled along toward his destination. If the streets are not too crowded, any horse in the stables will make his mile in four minutes, and he bends to his work with as apparent understanding of the dignity and importance of his mission as that shown by the fire department horses. The ambulance itself is a triumph of ingenuity and invention. The bed in the bottom is of the softest and on strong deep springs. The vehicle is somber as a hearse, everything from pillows to bed, stretcher and curtains being dead black. About the sides within, splints are arranged, each with its lint bandage coiled about it ready for use. The stretcher is fastened securely, its iron rod strong enough to support the heaviest weight. Blankets, lint, bandages, belts for strapping down violent patients. Everything that can be needed for any possible emergency is there, while the doctor's satchel holds surgical instruments and stomach pump. Bellevue is known as the poor man's hospital, and thus the majority of calls come in from the poorer districts, and in large proportion from the vicinity of the swarming tenements on the east side. Accidents of every nature, and the long list of casualties caused by drink, furnish abundant material, though there is a large proportion of ordinary sicknesses, many of these cases being complicated by the privations of poverty. Hark! The hurry call has sounded. A bell in the stable instantly arouses both driver and horse. The harness, always suspended and ready to be dropped on the horse's back, is already in place. The stable doors fly open, and the ambulance is ready and rolls out before the reverberation of the five quick and imperative strokes of the signal gong have died away. The surgeon, whom another bell has summoned, is at the big archway, just as the ambulance furiously dashes up, and he springs to his seat in the rear. The address is given them, the driver gathers up the reins, and with a word to the horses, they are off at a mad pace. The ambulance is right of way, and takes the middle of the street, the gong sounding a loud and incessant alarm as they gallop on. The call has come from 16th Street, and as they turn the corner, a crowd is seen gathered about something on the sidewalk. Two or three policemen are there trying to keep free space about the huddled heap. The driver slows up and backs the ambulance to the sidewalk. Before this, the surgeon has sprung out and is bending over a man who lies there, deathly white, but quite unconscious, his head in a little pool of blood. It's out of a third-story window he came, head foremost, one of the policemen says. When I got to him, not a word could he say. It's dead he is, maybe, doctor. The surgeon's quick and practiced hands are passing swiftly over the prostrate figure. He has seen in a moment that the cuts on the head from which the blood streams are only superficial, but in another moment he discovers that the right leg is broken, and the fracture a serious one. A temporary splint must be put on before he can be moved, and it is produced at once from the ambulance. The man comes to himself and groans as the wounded leg is moved and dressed. The temporary bandaging is done in a moment. The patient is tenderly lifted into the ambulance, and the crowd, which has listened eagerly for every groan, disperses reluctantly. Going back to the hospital is a slower process. There is time for the surgeon to make out his slip, which must be handed in with each patient, and is really a short biography of the case. On a blank provided for this purpose, he writes that this is Patrick O'Rourke of 500 East 16th Street, and that he is a bricklayer. Patrick gives the name of some friend who can be informed of his condition, if necessary, and states how long he has been in the country, and how long in the city. Often when the ambulance pulls up at the hospital entrance, the slip is all ready as it is now. The receiving room doors are open as they come, 
there is a fixed routine that must be conformed with. The examining surgeon makes a hasty inspection of Pat's injuries and assigns him to one of the surgical wards. The officer on duty in the reception room receives the surgeon's slip, hardly looking at the patient, who is at once carried to the ward designated on the slip. Orderlies and nurses are on duty there. Pat looks about curiously, though he is in sharp pain. He has the prejudice of all the ignorant against hospitals, and has listened to tales of how the doctors cut up folks alive and eat the choice dishes that ought by rights to go to the patients. He's not certain as to whether he likes the bath to which he is forced to submit, not a full one, since his broken leg is in the way, but the orderlies take him in charge and sponge him off in warm water, then lay him in bed and report him as ready for the surgeon. It is the house surgeon who comes, and Pat's leg is soon put in permanent splints. Only three hours have passed since he made his sudden plunge from the window. It seems to him as many years. He sees supper trays brought in, and wonders if the fare is like that on the island, where he has once served a month for drunkenness. He knows these are all charity patients, and while he is thinking about it, his own supper of tea and toast appears. The white-capped nurse comes again shortly with something in a glass, and Pat takes the opiate without question. The ward grows quiet, for night has come. Now and then there is a groan from some cot, or the snore of a sleeping patient. The nurse tells him the pain will soon leave him, and he looks at her white cap and admires it, and her neat apron, and wonders if she and the others are like the Sisters of Charity, and... Wondering, he falls asleep, and knows no more till daylight. By the end of the second day, he feels quite at home, and has begun to take an interest in his temperature card. At first this puzzles him, but he listens attentively, as the nurse explains, and he looks at the card respectfully. After this he studies it for himself from day to day, and sees how he is gaining. This and the three meals a day are a constant interest and the fixed routine seems to make the time go faster. The men on either side of him tell their stories and listen to his. He had meant to resent the coming in of the students, but they do no harm, and he is rather interested in watching them and seeing how pleased they are the way his fractured bones are knitting. There are books and papers, and as he mends, he reads them. When he is promoted to crutches and takes his first unsteady steps on them, he is as proud as is a mother of her baby's first attempt, and his neighbors in adjoining cots seem to feel the same. The man on his right, whose diet he envied because now and then he had a little wine, is gone. His bed was empty one morning when Pat waked, and his left-hand neighbor says low, I was waking a bit in the night, and Casey went off that easy not one know he was gone till the night watch came along. They've took him down to the dead house, and soon they'll be cutting him up. Pat shudders, but an hour later, here's the nurse telling some inquiring friend that poor Casey's going to have a fine funeral with seven carriages, all paid for by his cousin in the Bowery. He changes his mind and is ready to swear that everything in the hospital is different from what he has been told. In spite of his leg, he feels better than he ever has in his life. His eyes have grown clear. His flesh looks fresh and wholesome, though he is pale from confinement. But he hobbles about the ward, growing stronger daily, and looking now and then at another card that is hung at the end of his cot ever since he came in. On it is written who Pat is and what he is there for. When the word cured is added, he will go out, and he wonders just how long will be needed. In the meantime, he reads, plays checkers or cards, eats his three meals with relish, and repeats his experience to all who will listen. At last comes a day when the doctor has him try his leg in various positions, and then, taking down the card, writes on it the magic word for which he has waited. Pat is cured. He goes down to the office, receives his discharge, and a little dazed with freedom and broad daylight, makes his way to his old quarters, 
let us hope to profit by his experience. This is the tale of the surgical ward, where Pat, while lying on his cot, has seen every form of injury, from a nose split by falling downstairs, to a fractured skull and a broken neck. For during his stay, the ambulance has made many another trip no less hurried than that made for him. It is nearly night when the clangor of the hurry call sounds over and over again, as if a strange hand were on it, and once more the ambulance dashes out on its errand of mercy. In five minutes the spot is reached, and the child who lies in the street, mercifully unconscious, is lifted gently after a hasty bandaging of the crushed foot. She has run before a horse car, has been thrown down, and will never run again, for the foot and leg half to the knee are a shapeless mass. When the sufferer has been gently placed on a stretcher, the ambulance returns to Bellevue at a swift pace. The little patient is taken to the reception room, and the examining surgeon at once assigns her to one of the surgical wards, whither she is taken. She has been undressed in a clean white nightgown, put on before consciousness returns. It is impossible to save the foot, and the surgeon decides on instant amputation to save further shock to the system. The operating table is always in readiness, and every facility for such an emergency at hand. Small time is needed for preparation, and now the nurses comfort her as they tell her to breathe through a curious cylinder they have put over her nose, and she will soon feel better. She struggles a little at first, but soon yields to the influence of ether and lies in an unconsciousness too deep for surgeon's knife to break. They are ready for her in the operating room attached to the ward, whether she is at once taken. Every instrument required is already in a shallow basin of antiseptic solution. Assistants stand each in place, including four or five white-capped nurses. The duty of each is clearly defined. One attends to nothing but the etherization of the patient, Another holds an antiseptic sponge and keeps the spot clean on which the surgeon is at work, or closes with forceps any blood vessels that may be exposed. A nurse hands every instrument as needed, and there are always one or two others with sponges and antiseptic fluids for emergency. Contrary to all popular opinion, it is a bloodless operation, nor is it a straight cut through the bone. A flap must be made, and the nurses watch carefully as the surgeon takes the foot in one hand, and with the other makes a V-shaped incision after the first cut, or so which finishes the amputation begun by the car wheel. All the jagged ends of bone are now sawed off. The blood vessels are taken up and tied with catgut, and the flesh is brought together over the exposed bones and carefully tied edge to edge so that it will easily unite. At intervals, the wound had been freely wet with antiseptic solution, and is now powdered with iodoform. Careful bandaging finishes the operation, and in half an hour from the time it began, the child is again in bed, and slowly returning to consciousness. She is drowsy, but in less pain than when she was put under the influence of ether. Sleep soon follows, and the little patient does not know till the next day that her foot is gone. In special or unusual cases demanding extra attention, a class of students and nurses is often present at a bedside consultation. As the experienced surgeon lays down the appropriate law to the students, he is supplemented by the more experienced head nurses, the younger ones eagerly drinking in every item mentioned by the authorities they strive to follow. Antiseptic methods have revolutionized modern hospital surgery. Twenty-five years ago, a surgeon who succeeded in closing a wound so that it healed by the first intention, as their phrase has it, congratulated himself on a triumph, which might as easily have been a failure. The germ theory is at the bottom of this, and many other things. Air and water are full of these deadly germs that irritate and inflame a wound if enclosed in it. But if this difficulty is conquered by the use of some harmless chemical in water, which has been carefully distilled, all danger ceases. The surgeon's hands, the instruments, sponges, everything coming in contact with such a wound, 
must be kept wet with this solution. With such precautions as these, operations that a generation ago were considered inevitably fatal are performed with perfect success, while wounds that once required six weeks for cure heal now in two or three, leaving only the faintest of scars. There is no surgical fever as in the past, and the whole process has been brought to almost absolute perfection. It is to the great epitheater of Bellevue that much of this progress is due. We are apt to think of a hospital as a place where young medical students experiment at will, often with barbarous disregard of patients' rights and feelings. There are, sometimes, such instances, it is true, but they are of the rarest. Take the actual facts of an appointment to each position. The highest prize sought yearly by the graduates of the medical colleges is a hospital appointment. In the class of one of the house surgeons at Bellevue were over 200 students. The 20 who stood highest were the ones eligible for such appointment, and out of these 20, but four would be chosen. Thus the men who won were the cream of the 200, and they accepted a task that only a man devoted to his profession would take. The work is in the highest degree responsible and burdensome, and there is no evading it. Food and sleep must often be renounced to meet the unceasing demands of the place. Its compensation is the experience, of which more is gained in a week than a year of private practice would bring, and the ease of getting into regular practice after such a probation. It is in the wards that the student's work is chiefly done, in the great amphitheater, Operations are performed before the students by the most famous surgeons of New York, who gladly operate for the sake of keeping up their facility as well as for humanity's sake. It is thus perfectly true that the charity patients at Bellevue receives as skilled treatment and careful nursing as falls to the lot of the rich man. Trained nurses watch for every change. A physician is within sound of his voice, and the visiting surgeon is ready to note every particular of the case. Home is best when the convalescence begins, for there can be more freedom there. But till then a hospital ward must be counted one of the greatest of modern blessings, and the security it affords that the wisest and best course will be taken with the patient. The Bellevue Amphitheater is famous. No operating room in the world has witnessed so many or so frequent triumphs of surgical skill. About the bare and unattractive apartment rises a deep bank of seats capable of holding between three and four hundred. In the arena stands the operating table in the space about twelve feet wide. It is low and long, seven feet by two, and has on it a thin hard mattress covered with rubber. No one who's laid upon it knows it to be hard or soft. Once upon it, the merciful ether quickly does its work, and the patient, whose face is hidden by the cone, lies flat with their head turned to one side that the tongue may not interfere with the breathing. The medical college professor in charge explains to the assembled students the nature of the operation, and work begins. It is of the swiftest. A leg has been known to be taken off in fifteen seconds. That did not complete the operation, but the time between the first touch of the knife and the removal of the severed leg was less than a quarter of a minute. It was a case of hip disease, in which the leg was taken off a little below, to avoid hemorrhage, and then the bone removed at the joint. Skill like this has its own fascination, and the amphitheater could tell many a tale of operations that are romances. Enthusiasm, skill, well nigh miraculous, results as thoroughly so are part of the story of any modern hospital, and surgery has reached the point of science where uncertainty is small indeed. The child whose foot was taken off will go home in a fortnight or three weeks as well as ever, and the artificial foot that will be provided her is as like a natural one as science can make it, which is saying much. Comparatively few surgical operations result fatally. There are naturally some cases where a small chance exists for recovery, but the chance is always taken. Occasionally the last hours of an incurable are made comfortable by an operation undertaken with no other object and the peaceful end for the patient, and the life that has known only pain and anguish finds tranquility and peace in dying. I told her 
I might be able to give her two days of comfort by an operation. It might be a shorter time, and she might die under the knife, said a surgeon of a patient. On the other hand, without an operation she would continue to suffer till she died. I told her husband the same. Both consented to make the trial. He, because he could not endure seeing her agonies. She, because she could not endure having him see them. I performed the operation. She lived just thirty-six hours in peace. Afterward he thanked me, with tears rolling down his cheeks, for those last precious painless hours, although they hastened the end. In the medical ward the same skillful treatment and careful attendance is maintained. For each and all are the white-capped nurses, the serious doctors, the throng of students, and the constant coming and going of new cases. Twelve hundred beds are always full. Every form of malady or deformity that can afflict mankind is seen in these wards, in which a constant weeding-out process goes on. Contagious diseases are sent to their appropriate hospital. Each special disease has its own hospital and staff of specialists, and the dispensaries which form part of the hospital system take pains to send patients needing hospital treatment to the proper one. The drug department at Bellevue annually dispenses for use in this hospital alone about 135,000 yards of surgical gauze, 600 pounds of lint, 8,500 pounds of absorbent cotton, 50 bales of oakum, and vast quantities of drugs, including nearly 1,000 pounds of ether. In the cellar, about 75,000 bottles are washed annually. Though many are free, it is the endeavor to make patients pay where possible, though at Bellevue the highest charge is only $3 and a half a week. In the New York hospital prices range from 7 to $30 a week, and in the private rooms, one may receive a care impossible in any private house, even with a trained nurse. But the prejudice against hospitals as a whole runs through all ranks, and naturally enough. The freedom of home, the desire that those who are best loved may be near one, and the fear of dying alone, save for hired attendants, will always deter the great majority from accepting the hospital as the best place for quick and effectual treatment of disease. For the mass who have no choice, or who are incapable of paying for attendance at home, the growth of special hospitals is often a boon beyond words. The specialty of the New York hospital is its surgical cases, and like most others, it objects strongly to chronic ones. This at times bears heavily upon applicants. A perfectly respectable man who has spent all his money and is suffering from some chronic trouble that has disabled him, may make the rounds of the hospitals, growing more and more despairing with every refusal. St. Luke's most often opens its doors to such, but only five hospitals out of the long list are bound by their charter to take every patient that applies for admission. Nearly all will take what are called emergency cases, but a chronic invalid fills the room sorely needed for cases that demand immediate attention. The usual length of time for the ordinary patient is from a week to seventeen days, and there is constant pressure for room. No hospital likes to increase its death rate, and there is always a little feeling on this point. Bellevue sometimes makes complaint that if the other hospitals receive cases likely to die on their hands, they transfer them at once to it, as in the case of a large fire, where several were burned so severely that death was inevitable. There is an explanation for this, and a perfectly reasonable one. In the New York hospital, for example, with its large proportion of serious cases of surgical operations, the recovery depends almost entirely on perfect rest and quiet. Even one severely burned patient, delirious and noisy, as all such are likely to be, will keep the entire ward in an uproar, this meaning certain death for many other patients. It is a case where the individual must sometimes suffer for the general good, but such cases are rare. As a rule, the stranger or citizen alike who needs help finds it, and the long roll of hospitals and dispensaries means a beneficence that is hardly possible to overestimate.
there is one hospital whose roof affords a strange and piteous sight. It is the orthopedic hospital on Lexington Avenue, and the roof is its playground for its convalescents. Here are deformed little ones, some with feet bent double, some with bodies sat laterally from hips, twisted, bent, held up by iron bolts and trusses, and all devices of modern surgery. And here on the roof, far remote from the din of streets, they play as if sickness were not and pain had been forgotten. Wonderful cures go out from here, and if there are not always cures, there is always relief. An hour spent in the children's ward of any great hospital convinces one that for the majority, home could offer nothing so perfect in care, and often nothing so wise and tender. The first entrance into such a ward fills one with pity and sympathy that is often heartbreaking. They are so patient, these suffering little ones, who obey implicitly, and bear their pain so mutely, that even the experienced doctors and nurses are often moved to tears of wonder and pity. They are easily entertained. A scrapbook of bright pictures, a doll that can be hugged close, a toy or flower are dear delights. Many visitors come and go, and seldom come empty-handed. Often the child finds special friends, and is adopted or otherwise cared for, and often in the quiet and healing of long weeks of cleanliness, good food, and all that had been lacking in a life of poverty before, real health begins, and the child lays the foundation of a new life. A children's ward is a world in itself, in which the inhabitants are little people, with different language, manners, feelings, and thoughts to men and women. Children are much more difficult to nurse than adults. Their language is often quite inadequate to express what they feel, and in their sorrows and wants they are more or less dumb. A nurse must read the unwritten speech of their eyes, hands, and feet, and watch their tears, smiles, gestures, and expressions to divine what they mean. A celebrated French physician, who had charge of the hospital for waifs and strays in Paris, declared that he was able to diagnose children's diseases from the lines and furrows on their faces. A skillful nurse will learn almost as much from their cries. It is beautiful to see how the eyes of the little sufferers brighten when the nurses speak to them in their low and gentle voices, when they have got over the worst of their troubles and find themselves in pleasant rooms made still more cheerful by pictures, illuminated texts and flowers, common possession of picture books, dolls, Noah's arks, rocking horses, and live kittens, and sole proprietors of other toys, with little shelves to range them on, well fed and cleanly clad, and waited on by these kindly ministering angels. The little patients must almost fancy themselves in heaven. As strength comes back to them, they indulge in plenty of fun. They play at doctors, gravely looking at one another's tongues and feeling one another's pulses. They cuddle and dress up their kittens like babies and put their doll's hair into curl papers. When convalescence permits a little more latitude in diet, they are often as hard to please as patients of older years. One little mite, when asked to order her dinner, demanded, Beefsteak and onions, and another, Sausages. In the ordinary wards, there is a medley of cases. Of those seen in a recent visit to a children's ward, some were on the floor playing, while others watched them from the spotlessly white little beds. One small boy, who had been beaten almost to a jelly by a drunken father, howled at the top of his lungs while his wounds were being dressed, and when all was over, proceeded to torment every other child in the ward. There is always one nuisance of this description, and it complicates the nurse's work immensely. He was sent back to bed finally, and lay there kicking off the coverlet, or winding it about him till quieted by a fresh scrapbook. Next to him was a three-year-old child, swathed in bandages. It had been thrown on a red-hot stove by a drunken mother, and it was doubtful if the contracted sinews could ever be made to yield. A seven-year-old child with his right leg in plaster was kicked downstairs by his father, who was now on Blackwell's Island. And next to him was Tommy, aged three, sitting up and just recovering from a burn contracted on his own account, 
and examining a kettle of boiling water. Yonder might of a girl has lost one leg, and is destined to lose the other. Her pride in the perambulator in which she takes her airings, in which she looks upon as her own private carriage, is the way in which the wind is tempered to the shorn lamb. Another is waiting for the surgeon to free her from a hideous tumor. A third is crying, not so much on account of her own sufferings, as because it is washing day at home, and she cannot be there to mind the baby. We are apt to lose sight of the fact that children live in the present. The little ones are cognizant of no past and no future, and therefore, while they suffer, they suffer with their entire nature. They have no superannuated memories, no philosophy by which to rob grief of its sting. Thus their sorrows fill their whole hearts and minds, although they weep but for the loss of a plaything or the broken neck of a doll. Most nurses love children. One can see the motherhood in their eyes as they bend over their cots and soothe them to sleep, and small wonder that they love them so well. The most beautiful thing in this life is the faith and trust of a child, and the world can never grow old while it possesses little children. Most of those in the children's ward come from terrible homes, where they see vice and sin rampant, and the world, the flesh, and the devil are present both night and day. No halo of love and goodness surrounds their poor lives as a rule, but they grow up to sin in their wretched tenement rooms as easily as they would grow up to be good and happy homes. One night not long since a child in a hospital ward lay dying. She heard some drunken men brawl as they passed under the window. That's father, the child said. He comes home tipsy every night. The nurse looked at the little face and thought it was terrible that the child should die, having known nothing of this world but its sin. She spoke of God and of heaven, but the child could not understand. Taking some violets from a cup on the table, the nurse said, Look at these. The flowers in heaven are more beautiful than violets. Oh, then may I pick them? said the child. In spite of the loving care lavished on the little sufferers, and by the flower-like way in which those who are getting over their sufferings open to the sunshine, sadness must be the dominant outcome of a walk through the children's ward, all the more so if the visitor has healthy, rollicking children of his own waiting to welcome him at home. At the end of the lawn at Bellevue, close by the river, and partly extending over the water, is a long, low building. It is the morgue, where lie, often to the number of thirty or forty, the unclaimed and unknown dead in rough pine boxes of the very cheapest description. At the head of each coffin is tacked a card, giving all the information that is known of each case. Of those who die in hospital, it is generally possible to give the name, age, native place, and date of death, and these items are carefully noted on the card. It is also stated whether the person died friendless, or the body is waiting for friends, but the majority of the silent occupants of the morgue are unknown. They wait in vain for friends to identify them, and find rest at last in nameless graves in the potter's field. As one portion of Bellevue seldom seen by the public, and holding almost as much tragedy as the morgue not far beyond, it is the prisoner's ward, where are cells for sick prisoners of every order. Slight ailments are treated by police surgeons in the various jails of the city where prisoners happen to be lodged. The numerous police station houses also have cells where an army of prisoners is confined every night. But the tombs is the great receiving center, over 50,000 prisoners passing through it annually. Naturally, then, there are many patients, and all critical cases are removed to Bellevue. Often, too, an attempted murder, where the murderer seeks suicide as his only way out. Both murderer and victim may be taken here. Men, women, and even children, who stab and throttle even more than the newspapers record, lie under guard, knowing that when recovery comes, the law in its course awaits them. Here come weeping friends, sadder even than those who seek the morgue, and breathe freer when they find that death has ended the career that was disgrace and misery for both sinner and sinned against. To one of these cells there came one morning a woman, bearing the usual permit 
to visit a patient. She was a slender, pale little woman, with a look of delicate refinement that sorrow had only intensified, and she looked at the physician, who was just leaving the patient, with clear eyes which had wept often, who kept their steady, straightforward gaze. "'I am not certain,' she said. "'I have searched for my boy for a long while, and I think he must be here. All the clues have led me here. I want to see him.' The doctor looked at her pitifully as she went up to the narrow bed where the patient lay a lad of hardly twenty, with his face buried in the pillow, his fair hair, waving crisply against the skin browned by exposure, had not yet been cut, for the hospital barber who stood there had found it so far impossible to make him turn his head. "'He's lain that way ever since they brought him in yesterday,' said the barber, and then, moved by something in the agitated face before him, turned his own away. The mother, for it was quite plain who this must be, stooped over the prostrate figure. She knew it, as mothers know their own, and laid her hand on the burning head. "'Charlie?' she said softly, as if she had come into his room to rouse him from some boyish sleep. "'Mother is here?' A wild cry rang out that startled even the experienced physician. "'For God's sake, take her away! "'She doesn't know what I am! "'Take her away!' "'The patient had started up "'and wrung hands of piteous entreaty. "'Take her away!' "'He still cried, "'but the mother gently folded her arms about him "'and drew his head to her breast. "'Oh, Charlie, I have found you,' "'she said through her sobs, "'and I will never lose you again.' "'The lad looked at her for a moment.' His eyes were like hers, large and clear, but with the experience of a thousand years in their depths. A beautiful, reckless face, with lines graven by passion and crime. Then he burst into weeping like a child. "'It's too late! It's too late!' he said in tones, almost inaudible. "'I'm doing you the only good turn I've done you, mother. I'm dying, and you won't have to break your heart over me any more.' It wasn't your fault. It was the cursed drink that ruined me, lighted my life and brought me here. It's murder now, but the hangman won't have me, and I shall save that much of disgrace for our name. As he spoke, he fell back upon his pillow. His face changed, and the unmistakable hue of death suddenly spread over his handsome features. The doctor came forward quickly a look of anxious surprise on his face. It was plain that the end was near. I didn't know he was that bad, the barber muttered under his breath, as he gazed at the lad holding still to his mother's hand. The doctor lifted his patient's head, and then laid it back softly. Life had fled. It is better to have it so, he said to himself in a low voice, and then stood silently and reverently, ready to offer consolation to the bereaved mother, whose face was still hidden in the boy's breast. She did not stir. Something in the motionless attitude aroused vague suspicion in the mind of the doctor, and moved him to bend forward and gently take her hand. With an involuntary start, he hastily lifted the prostrate form, and quickly felt pulse and heart, only to find them stilled forever. She is gone, too he softly whispered, and the tears stood in his eyes. Poor soul! It is the best thing for both of them. That is one story of the prison ward of Bellevue, and there are hundreds that might be told, though never one sadder, or holding deeper tragedy, than this one recorded here. End of chapter 13 Read by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida. Chapter 14 of Darkness and Daylight, or Lights and Shadows of New York Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Piotr Natter. Darkness and Daylight, or Lights and Shadows of New York Life. Chapter 14 by Helen Campbell Flower Missions and the Fresh Air Fund 
the distribution of flowers among the sick and poor, anecdotes and incidents. Twenty years and more of effort have made a different name for one of the most infamous regions of New York. Corlier's Hook, once unknown ground to all save the police and the gangs of thieves, murderers and tramps that infested it, is no longer the scene of murders and other terrible crimes that made it notorious a generation ago. But it is still one of the most lawless regions in the city, and the headquarters for the most daring of the river thieves. The hook proper is at the bend of the East River. The great machine shops and storage warehouses that lie along its front are hives of industry by day, but when night comes and workmen and clerks have departed, it is a deserted region. Back of these shops and warehouses lies a network of narrow streets and lanes, in the squalid rookeries of which the thieves often conceal the plunder obtained in their nightly raids on the river. Like the Five Points, it was for years dangerous to venture there after nightfall, and like that quarter it owes its partial reconstruction to the work of the Children's Aid Society and the various missions under its care. The children of Corlier's Hook fare better than those of the Five Points in one sense, for they live along the river front, play on the docks and woodpiles, enjoy the sunshine like any young neapolitan and swim and sport in the river under the very eyes of the police every available inch of ground is made use of for houses each lot having a rare tenement also thus shutting out air and sun and the children fly from these dens to the docks where they take their first lessons in thieving more than twenty years ago the founder of the children's aid society while wandering among the wretched dwellings and pondering as to the fate of these waves, came upon an old shell of a public school building, with the unusual advantage of being open to air and sun on four sides. This was at once rented, and was afterwards transformed into one of the most novel and attractive agencies for good that can be found in the city. The man chosen for its superintendent had not only love for his work, but a keen artistic sense. Any room in his hands, by means of plants, flowers, leaves, or even old prints and engravings, took on a pleasant aspect, and he brought all his gifts to bear upon this forsaken spot, with its surroundings of old rookeries and broken-down tenements. The backyard, a mere strip of a place hardly bigger than a respectable closet, was the first to yield to his magic touch. Here he planted shrubs, flowers, and vines about the shaded seat, where for a moment those who rested on it might fancy themselves in the country. Sewers and bilge water were the best known smells in this region, and he fought them with hyacinths and heliotrope and violets. In the schoolroom above, and through the lodging house, which was part of the mission of the building, plants and flowers were scattered about, unconsciously taming the rough little subjects who came in and who begged for a single flower with an eagerness that could not be denied. Windows overran with them. Bud and blossom, green leaves, and trailing vines were everywhere. The little yard was full, and the superintendent proceeded to build a greenhouse, where, though he had never learned the art of floriculture, he had marvellous success. Soon a noble reward was suggested to the young vagabonds of Rivington Street, and indeed of the whole region, who flocked in, full of delight, over the growing things. The best children in the school were allowed to take a plant home with them, and if they brought it back in a few months, improved and well cared for, they received others as a premium. Soon, in the windows of the poorest, most tumble-down houses and tenement rookeries, one saw flowers growing, and met the little savages of the district, carrying a plant more carefully than they did the baby entrusted to their care. A little aquarium in the schoolroom, with its aquatic plants, was no less a dear delight, and children came from miles away, attracted by the fame the flowers and plants had given to the mission. The supply of flowers proved utterly inadequate to the demand. Sick children in the ward begged for them, and a few wealthy persons, who knew of the work that was being carried on, sent occasional supplies from their greenhouses, but even this was not enough and formal appeal was made to the public for flowers for the poor and especially for the sick children's mission and the hospital it was thus that the first flower mission of new york began its work the appeal was generously answered from all sides 
Sunday school children especially were interested in hearing of the sick children, who perhaps had never seen a flower, and they gathered wild ones or began little gardens on their own account. A receiving room was soon a necessity, where all flowers were sent. A large table, long enough and broad enough to hold the loose flowers and allow of sorting them, shallow traps for receiving the bouquets, plenty of string and scissors, and a few chairs completed the furniture of the room. Beginning as a mission, the undertaking, like everything else with which Mr. Brace had to do, took on many phases. As much space as possible had been utilized for lodgers. A school had been opened at once, and the care of plants and flowers had been part of its work. And thus, as the building enlarged and the work grew, many interests centered under the one roof, and still distinguished it from other homes belonging to the same society. In the home itself, which very shortly became the property of the society, and which is now known as the East Side Lodging House for Boys, another feature was soon added. A small building was put up in the rear for bathing purposes, and upon this a greenhouse was built, opening into the schoolroom, so that today every street waif who looks up from his desk sees a vista of flowers. The superintendent's own rooms are a bower of green, and the expression of the whole place is unlike that of any other home or refuge in the whole city. A propagating house was added, from which thousands of slips were given out, and recently its capacity has been so increased that over 50,000 plants are propagated from seeds or cuttings during the year. The great difficulty comes with the winter months, when distributing work among the tenements ceases, and the young potted stock must be cared for. Most of the young plants are given as prizes to the children of the many industrial schools connected with the society, and the floral festival once a year brings them back again as evidence of the care bestowed. On that day the mothers come with the children, and the spacious audience room is filled with a mass of green. The girls succeed best, and show their specimens with pride. Often a severe winter kills their pets, but this is much less common since the use of self-feeding stoves began, which even in the coldest nights keep the temperature above freezing point. Thousands of poor families now have their windows filled with beautiful plants. They have learned the art of propagating the hardiest kinds, and ivies, fuchsias, and geraniums flourish under their care, but there is always lack of pots. Old tin cans with flaming labels or small wooden boxes take their place, but the plants can never thrive so well as in pots with proper drainage. To supply the demand for them would require a fund of no less than $250, and this has never yet been raised. There are floral committees in many of the surrounding country towns, and there is growing interest in the work of flower missions. The season opens about the 1st of May with bouquets of wild flowers and closes in November with gorgeous chrysanthemums. Flowers come in all sorts of ways. Those who understand the work either make them in small bouquets or separate the varieties, lying them in flat baskets with layers of wet cotton batting between. Often they come in great bunches and must be sorted and made over. Railroads and express companies deliver them free and each year the interest increases. Distribution is the heaviest task. City missionaries, Bible readers, nurses, and druggists throughout the poor districts all cooperate in the work, and last year saw the distribution of over a 100,000 bouquets and bunches of flowers among the sick and the poor. The general mission, known as the New York City Flower Mission, whose rooms are at 104 East 20th Street, does active work from May to November, distributing both flowers and fruit. 400 towns in the vicinity of the city are contributors, and Smith, Amherst, and Vassar colleges also send flowers. Not only hospitals of all sorts, but the homes for the aged and infirm are now included in the work of distribution. Some donors make a speciality of one flower. Pinks come in profusion from one well-known name, and an unknown contributor registered as the pansy man sends in thousands of his favorite flower while from another source in one year came eighteen hundred pond lilies fruit is distributed to some extent but flowers seem most desired 
Men in hospitals beg for pinks and look after the distributors with hungry eyes. Women prefer roses, and the children clutch at anything with color and sweetness. There are as many stories as flowers in this work. In one window of a rare tenement, three geraniums bloom and show thrifty growth, which owe their life to the care of three tots who daily take them to walk with a devotion which even the street Arabs respect. They march with them to Tompkins Square and sit in the sun till the pots are supposed to be charged with it. That they are giving themselves also a bath of healing and health does not suggest itself directly, but indirectly many a mother has learned that, if plants would thrive, sun and air and water must be had, and has, in degree at least, applied the lesson to the little human plants in their keeping. In the general distribution, all classes are cared for. From the sick child in hospital ward or stifling tenement house to the sewing girl working through the long summer days on the heavy woolen garments that must be ready for the fall and winter trade, there is always the sorrow of the poor and the bitter want that is so often part of the tragedy. Not till one has seen how pale faces light and thin hands stretch eagerly for this bit of brightness and comfort can there be much realization of what the flower mission really does and what it means to its thousands of beneficiaries the poorest know it best there is a grim tenement house on roosevelt street where a pretty child with drunken father and hard-working patient mother lay day after day in the exhaustion of fever nothing could rouse him and the mother said sorrowfully he'll go the way of all the rest and i'm not knowing but he'll be better off a city missionary bearing her load of bloom from country fields and meadows brought in a bunch of buttercups and laid them in the wasted little hand which closed upon them with sudden energy the dim eyes opened wide and the dry little lips smiled faintly as the child looked at the pretty yellow flowers all that monday he held them tight clasping them closer and his mother tried to take them and put them in water when he fell asleep she set them in a broken cup close by him, and he reached for them as soon as he awoke. On Thursday, the missionary, who came again with fresh ones, found the withered stems still in the little hand. Sure, I've done the best I could, said the mother, and kept them in water whenever he'd give me the chance, but he won't hear to them being anywhere but just in his hand. They'll be the making of him, maybe and now he'll be willing to eat, and I'm thinking, please God, he'll live after all. The crippled children show the same delight, carrying the flowers to bed with them, and watching the distribution with eager eyes. Prisoners in the jail, men and women alike, stretch their hands through the bars for them, and there is one woman whose life, to the deep amazement of everybody concerned, has altered utterly under their influence. It is Long Saul, well known to the hook as thief, drunkard, fighter, and general disturber of the peace, a powerful creature, nearly six feet tall, and with muscles of a man, who fought and bit when arrested, and had left her mark on many a policeman. Over and over again she had been sent to the island, emerging sometimes to a period of hard work, which she knew well how to do, and then relapsing into old ways into the tombs one day came the city missionary with some tiny bouquets a sprig of geranium and a bright verbena and long sol looked at her wistfully the missionary had not meant to give her one indeed there had been no thought that she would do anything but throw them aside contemptuously but long sol eagerly took them and retreated to her cell from which issued presently a call for the matron this patient and much enduring woman who appeared in due time looked with amazement hardly less than that of the missionary at the new expression at sal's blear-eyed sodden face i used to have great luck with slips when i was a gal said long sal give me a bottle or something with water in it and more than likely this bit of geranium will live the matron brought it silently fearing to add a word and Sal tended her geranium with devotion, sending it out regularly by the keeper for air and the sunning. It prospered, and as it grew, something grew with it. When Sal's day of release came, she looked at the three new leaves on her slip, as if each one were a talisman, and the matron said to her, When you are settled, Sal, and at work again, I will give you another plant. 
Sol was silent, but as she walked away, bearing the precious baby geranium, she cast back one look at the matron, an inscrutable look that might mean a fixed intention not to settle down at all, or a dim and undefined resolution to make the plant life a success, whatever might come to her own. It is the truest things that carry often the most improbable sound with their telling, and so all are welcome to doubt the tale. But it stands on record that Sol, though yielding now and then to her old temptation of drink, remained faithful to whatever pledge she had made to geranium, which grows still, a great plant, every leaf cared for to the utmost, by the woman who was once the terror of the world. She is not a saint even now, but she is no longer a terror, nor is she alone in the experience which bears witness to what power dwells in beauty, and how, even what looks most helpless, may, through the ministry of flowers, be reached in ways of which man has not yet found out the knowledge. The fresh air fund and its mission are no less important, but it reaches children alone, though in special cases infants with their mothers are allowed to share its benefits. This form of charity, however, is rather for the seaside homes, and one or two places where small homes have been opened for those who need the country. The Fresh Air Fund, known at present as the Tribune Fresh Air Fund, is quite apart from these, and began, like the work of the Children's Aid Society, in the thought of one man. It is to the Reverend William Parsons, then a minister in a little country town in Pennsylvania, that the movement owes its birth. Yet, true to that curious law by which, in spots far remote from each other, the same thought makes itself felt, a wise woman, whose name is associated with much of the best work done in Philadelphia, at the same time, and almost in the same way, declared the necessity of some action in behalf of the children of the poor, and thus the, quote-unquote, country week was born. The young minister shared the stare, and perhaps set the first waves in vibration. At any rate, he had long had it at heart, and it had been talked over with a woman who, from her invalid room, looked out upon the world through others' eyes, but with an insight that went to the heart of all possibilities for help. Her word meant force equivalent to that of a dozen elders, and having told all his heart, and found that his thought was sane and wise, the young minister went home and preached to his flock of hard-working Pennsylvania farmers a sermon that bore more fruit than even his wildest wish had conceived as possible. The first letter written on the subject deserves record here. Sherman, Pennsylvania, June 3, 1877 My dear Mrs. L., the ball is in motion. I took for my text this morning, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, ye have done it unto me. And I made the practical bearing of my words the bringing out into our homes of some of the waifs and outcasts from the city. One man stopped on his way home to say that he would take four. In another house there is a call for a mother and baby, and so on through the town. The enthusiasm and response of my people have delighted me. Next to get the money, then to tell the children. Must not two weeks in this pure mountain air be felt by them in afterlife? It seems to me that they are all but here. Now may I have the introduction you promised me to Dr. Egglestone. I shall try for a pass over the road to go back and forth with the children myself, and perhaps I can arrange with some of these good people on the way to bring us a counter lunch as the train comes along. Some good angel whisper it in the ears of the little ones. Tell tired mothers there is life for their children in this fresh country air. Signed, Willard Parsons. The name was an unknown one outside his own parish, but through Dr. Eggleston, who was just about to sail for Europe, interest was aroused. The airy railroad proved that one corporation at least had a soul, for full fares were reduced to half fares and half to quarter, and a pass was given Mr. Parsons, and on July 19th the first group went out. Nine children, mere wraiths of what wholesome childhood should be, were there, crippled in consumption, weak from whooping cough, each one stamped by disease, and pinched and thin for want of food. There was doubt as to how they could bear the journey, but excitement kept them up, and a long night's rest made them ready for the miracles of the first country day. 
with morning they swarmed out to quote unquote, catch raspberries and make acquaintance with the soil in general good portions of which were brought in on clothes and hands they proved perfectly manageable and at the end of the two weeks returned home transformed from prematurely old sad-eyed little figures into live children weighted down with gifts and crying to stay longer their places were taken by seventeen new ones received this time without anxiety for the work was now understood a blue ribbon bow was chosen as the badge and the group who next went out were all sufferers with a dozen ailments the diary of that summer's work is full of pathos and no less full of absurdity the sixty who shared the good provided for them did so at a total cost of one hundred and eighty seven dollars and sixty two cents but it was far easier at first to get the money than to get the children often the little thing was a breadwinner and the widowed mother perhaps an invalid herself, did not know how to spare the sum brought in. Sometimes, too, the childish hands did the housework and, quote-unquote, minded baby, while the mother went out to day's work, and sometimes there was dark suspicion of motives, and parents nodded significantly as they said to one another, I'll not be letting my children be kidnapped away, and me maybe never setting eyes on them again. For the most part, there was at last full recognition of the good involved. Often the children made friends for life, and adoption resulted in some cases. For all, the same experience was certain. A fortnight of bliss and revelation, and a return loaded down with strange packages of everything that could be carried. The unpleasant side was chiefly the burning of straw and washing of ticks. Some of the children had never slept in the bed and all required to be taught what daily washing meant, and all the first principles of cleanliness. Very soon it became evident that working girls needed help almost as seriously, but many objections arose. Children could be disciplined, and taught much even in a week's stay. But growing girls, paired very probably, self-sufficient and aggressive, were a very different matter. One resolute woman, who had announced that she would tie her own children to a tree, if need be, rather than reject the waif who needed her home, decided to take in the girls and see what would come of it. They were to pay what they could, and the rate was fixed at two dollars a week. Six girls came for a fortnight, and never did dollars of their earnings produce such rich results. So far from being aggressive, they were gentle, timid, overworked creatures, requiring constant assurance to make them willing to take all intended for them. Other doors were opened at once. It was found that three dollars a week for board and washing still left a margin of profit for their entertainers. Today shop girls and working girls of every order are provided for, and also young mothers worn with care and working women in all occupations. Mr. Parsons has for years had full charge of what is generally known as the Tribune Fresh Air Fund, but many papers aid in the same work, recognizing him as leader. It is impossible to give more than a hint of its wide-reaching beneficence, but a typical case must find room here as the strongest illustration of what possibilities lie in the work, which is far more in the line of the self-protection of society than a charity. Long ago, in a dull old street, making part of an equally dull and colorless part of old New York, A very solitary child extracted such amusement from life as forty feet of backyard could afford. He sat in his small rocking chair and listened to the talk about him, growing a little paler, a little more uncanny all the time, till one day a country cousin appeared, and, horrified that anything so old and weasoned could call itself a boy, begged that he might go home with her. There was infinite objection, but her point was finally carried, and the child found himself suddenly in a country village, a great garden about the house, a family dog and cat, a cow, an old horse, and all the belongings of village life. Old-fashioned flowers were all about, and the old-fashioned boy sat down in the garden path by a bed of spice pinks and looked at them, his hands folded, and a species of adoration on his face. "'Pick some!' said the cousin. Pick as many as you want. Pick them, repeated the old-fashioned boy. I'm afraid to. Ain't they gods? 
An hour later the seven years' crust had broken once for all, and the child who had to be put to bed exhausted from his scrambles through and over every unaccustomed thing began to live his first day of real child life. When the time came for his return, he begged with such passion of eagerness, such storms of sobs and cries for longer stay, that the unwilling aunt and grandmother left him there, and, finding the transformation when he did return, beyond either comprehension or management, sent him back to the life he craved. Today he holds high rank among American painters, though only heaven knows how the possibility of such development found place in this strange offshoot of a Philistine race. But he counts his own birthday from the hour when the first sense of sky and grass and flowers dawned upon him, and he looked upon the garden that he thought truly God had planted. End of chapter 14「Chapter Fifteen of Darkness and Daylight, or Lights and Shadows of New York Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Kristen Hand. Darkness and Daylight, or Lights and Shadows of New York Life. Chapter Fifteen by Helen Campbell. A day in a free dispensary, relieving the suffering poor, missionary nurses and their work, a touching story. In the lower wards of the city is concentrated the strange foreign life that gives New York its title of cosmopolitan. One might even say that these streets, with their always flowing tide of humanity, a procession never ending and never ceasing its march, was simply the continuation of that begun in the Middle Ages, of which Michelet says that they presented the spectacle only of a vast funeral pile, on which mounted successively Jew, Saracen, Catholic, and Protestant. We do not burn the people, but we do stifle and poison them in the tenement houses which are the disgrace of the city. In the old days, say fifty or sixty years ago, these streets were quiet, shaded places filled with the homes of the well-to-do. First came the Irish, and the Americans fled before them. Presently, the newcomers vacated the tenement houses for better quarters a little farther up, and as they left, hod carrying and kindred employments, and developed into the rulers of the city, they ascended still farther, till now Fifth Avenue knows them, and many another street into which money has carried them. Later came the Italians to fill the emptying places, while the German Jews crowded the streets farther down. Now they too are moving on, forced out by the swarm of Polish, Hungarian, and Russian Jews. They fill whole streets, as well as the schools which once had a monopoly of the German element, and the old New Yorker occasionally wonders where the American is to go. Cosmopolitan the city certainly is, since it is the first Irish and the third German city in the world. But one soon discovers that even under its most foreign aspect, these new arrivals grouped in picturesque confusion are not by any means the same as when at home. Already the new leaven has begun to work. The races have not yet blended, but the mere presence and contact of all these dissimilar atoms results in an amalgam which is itself American. London is an enormous aggregation of little villages. New York, even when one sees that each nationality has its own distinct place, is yet one, since every ballot cast in the eight or nine hundred ballot boxes open on election day finds its way at last to one center, typical of the real union underlying all differences. The terror often expressed as to the characteristics of the Russian and Polish Jews is, to one who has watched them closely, a very unfounded one. No one knows this better than the physicians of the great charity known as the Eastern Dispensary, which every year treats over 60,000 charity patients, mostly foreigners who are too poor to pay for medical advice or needed medicine. The point in regard to which fear is quite legitimate is the filth in which they live and the fact that in such filth, contagion is inevitable. 
Aside from this, they are far above the Irish in two cardinal virtues, thrift and abstemiousness. These virtues soon put them on their feet and make them in time property owners and employers. Why have they come? Because political persecution drove them from home. They were a friendless people before they came. They were not wanted there, and they are not wanted here. And yet they are here, to be dealt with in such fashion as we may. They are the most destitute people in the United States, for many of them fled from home, leaving every possession behind, and landed on free soil, paupers in everything but determination to work and earn. They land at Castle Garden, sick from confinement and dreadful crowding at sea, without money and without friends, and are directed to that quarter of the city that has become almost the exclusive property of their countrymen. They are hardly ever chronic charity seekers. Their diseases come from want and privation, very seldom from excess, and whoever looks into their patient faces sees a type that under favorable conditions will do good service to the Republic. What is a day at the Great Eastern Dispensary like? We will take Saturday, since it is the Hebrew holiday, and all the mothers who have been too busy through the week to pay much attention to their children's ailments wash and comb them now, and make part of the long procession climbing the stairs of the old armory, which has for many years served as dispensary, and which forms part of the old Essex Street Market. All the way down Grand Street from the Bowery, it is a German city that we are in, till, as Essex Street is neared, the names change somewhat, and over little shops one sees Hebrew signs and other tongues no less bewildering. Hardly an American is visible, save a stray visitor it may be, or someone hurrying through on business. The current at Essex Street sets toward the dispensary. One has only to follow, and in a moment, as the corner is turned, one sees the long flight of stairs and becomes one of the climbing crowd. At the top of the stairs, a door opens into a large room in which are many benches, all of different colors. This is the first mystery soon made plain. At the upper end of the room is a railed-off corner, the distributing bureau, and before the physician in charge is a long pad of tickets, of the same colors as the benches. The managing physician smiles as he anticipates our question. Why these many colored tickets and benches? Generally, but one ticket is given in the ordinary dispensary, he says. It gets dirty or torn, and there is also the danger of some infectious disease being communicated by it. Now we give fresh tickets at every visit, and, as most of the patients cannot read, the tickets are colored like the benches, so that patients know just where to go and wait their turn. All these doors opening from this receiving room lead into rooms where each specialty is treated. For example, this red ticket is surgical, and the patient goes and sits on a red bench till he hears the little bell from within, which is the signal to tell him his turn has come. Blue is medical, yellow, eye and ear, gray, diseases of women and children, green, dental. The white tickets, one with letters printed in blue and the other in red ink, indicate the morning medical and surgical treatment. They are all numbered, you see, and thus form a register of the number of cases daily and their character. Now the different rooms in turn can be visited, and an idea of the whole got in this way. It was hard to leave the corner from which observations could be taken at this first point of all. The great room had already over a hundred in waiting, chiefly mothers with babies or little children, but all ages were there also, and all degrees of forlornness. All languages were heard, but the German preponderated, as all spoke it with more or less fluency. Many of them could not understand why they could not be treated at once, but they moved on at last, accepting the testimony of someone more familiar with the routine. Formerly, all medicine was free, and if a patient did not like it, he broke his bottle and came back for another kind. With the attempt to make the institution self-supporting, this ended. Free medicine is still given to those who cannot pay, but, recognizing the pauperizing tendency of the free system for all, a fee of ten cents is now charged for those who can pay. The Irish complain loudly of this arrangement and demand free treatment, but the majority of the Hebrews pay without question. Where they say they cannot, they receive medicine free on the first application, and their names are sent to the United Hebrew Charities Association, 
or to that for improving the condition of the poor for investigation. The result of this is reported back to the dispensary. Thus, all applicants get immediate treatment, imposters are sifted out, and the deserving poor are brought to the notice of the benevolent at the time they most need it. Let us follow a patient with a blue ticket into the medical room. Our way lies past the drug department, before the window of which a crowd is already gathered. It is a motley one, stolid or eager, as national temperament compels. Weary mothers with sick and wailing babies in their arms, women with bandaged heads, and men with arms and slings. Children sent by sick fathers and mothers at home for needed medicine. On most of them is the unmistakable look that tells of patient suffering and half-starved lives. There is the Irish woman, ready for an instant assault on the clerk if he fails to give full measure, and her brother countrymen swearing that the city lets its doctor charge ten cents for a prescription when it's a free country and if all had their rights, charges would go down in a minute. The Italians eye them disdainfully and pay their money with dignity, and the sad-eyed Russian Jews give no token of what the inward comment may be. Reticence has grown with every century of oppression, and even freedom does not break the spell. There is nothing in the medical room but a table at which sit two physicians, two or three chairs, and a few instruments near the wash stand. Before one of the young, ear-looking men is a large open book, and the hesitating mother who has just entered with her babe looks at it apprehensively. It is the register of cases, so admirably arranged as to be a history of each one. The questions include name, age, birthplace, nationality, and disease, with memoranda as to the treatment. The applicants are in all degrees of trepidation. Now and then a young girl may laugh as she answers the queries, but for the most part there is seriousness painful to witness. The chief difficulty appears to be bronchial troubles. Often it is a touch of pneumonia or influenza, most often dyspepsia, born of insufficient and improper food. The keen-eyed young doctor has, like all dispensary physicians, gained the power of almost instant diagnosis, and it will do him admirable service when he forsakes this training school for general practice. It is this that makes the experience so valuable and so much sought after that admission is now on formal and rigid examination, and the position is no longer unpaid as formerly, but a salaried one. There is no time to hear the stories many would tell. These come later when the visiting physicians make their rounds. One can see without words what some of them must be, but now and then there is a pause as some especially sad case presents itself, and the young doctor's eyes look pitifully at the forlorn faces. But the bench is full of waiting patients, and we must pass on to the surgical room. It is only slight operations that are performed here, all severer ones going to the hospitals. Everything is done with antiseptic methods. Bandages, instruments, all that must be used are treated in this way, and at the same time everything is done to cause as little pain as possible. Chloroform is administered if necessary, and cocaine applied freely to lesser hurts. Young roughs come in to have a cut from knuckles sewed up or a bad bruise dressed. Women whose husbands have beaten them or given them a black eye are here, and all types of accidental injuries. The work is of the swiftest. There is little outcry, and the cases succeed each other with bewildering rapidity. All are entered in the register, as in the other rooms, and nearly all thank the doctors as they go out. The children's room is just across, and to reach it we must once more go through the motley throng in the general waiting room. By this time it is fairly swarming. The air is something inexpressible, though windows are open all about. In the children's little room, where a dark-eyed physician with the gentlest of faces is sitting, a row of babies of all ages and types is in waiting. Each mother, or sometimes father, for these Hebrew fathers are like mothers with their little ones, is told to loosen all the clothing so that a thorough examination can be made. Often it is only some lung or chest trouble, or more of general debility from wrong feeding. Sores, rashes, and so forth are sent into the room for skin diseases. Sometimes the babies cry. Oftener they look with pleased eyes at the kind faces, and sometimes they break into little gurgles and coos of applause. But they are sad-eyed little things, most of them, and take life very seriously, and often there is the frightened look that tells of neglect and frequent blows. 
There are shrieks from the dental room as we pass out, but they are mingled with a laugh, so that no one knows no tragedy is going on. The tragedy is nearer. On the stairs, waiting for breath to come, sits a little woman, with soft dark eyes and the look of a hunted animal. By her is a man, tall and gaunt, with somber black eyes burning in his pale face. The woman nods to the doctor as she enters his room, but she cannot speak for the moment, and the man looks at him dumbly, every feature worn with pain. A child presses against him with eyes like his own. The doctor stops for a moment, talks with husband and wife in German, and bids the man bear his back. Applying the stethoscope, he listens intensely to the patient's breathing, then turns away. There is little to be done, he says. He is nearly gone in consumption, but he does not know it, and I shall not tell him. His wife has asthma, as well as every one of the four children. They are hard workers, but down with sickness half the time, and then they half starve, for they tell no one of their condition till extremity is reached. The patience of these people has something terrible in it. This is the verdict of all who work among this order of the poor, and it is pleasant to see the change that grows slowly in them as the certainty of a living and freedom from oppression become confirmed. Their children will take on the spirit of the new life, and thus the city will have its return for any expenditure of money in general care. The perfecting of the dispensary system means a great decrease in the numbers who need hospital treatment, and it is the hope of all who understand the vital nature of the work done that the forty or more now in existence will all become self-supporting, at least in great degree. Prescribing at the dispensary itself is but the smallest part of the work done. Visiting physicians make a daily round among patients and thus have extended opportunity for detecting contagious diseases in their early stages, and by taking prompt measures they prevent the spread of such diseases throughout the city. As illustration, a patient who applied at the dispensary for relief was found to be suffering from scarlet fever. He was isolated from the other patients and notice was given to the Board of Health. He was removed to his home and placed in charge of one of the dispensary's visiting physicians who attended him constantly till he was well. This man lived in a crowded tenement and in common with its other occupants, he earned a living by working with a sewing machine. The Board of Health exerted its authority, fumigated and disinfected the house and all clothing made or in process of manufacture and prevented further similar work in the building till all danger was past. It is easy to see the extent to which this dangerous disease might have spread, but for its prompt discovery. In direct connection with general dispensary work, one finds the missionary nurses as cheery, bright-faced a set of women as the city holds. They must be strong, for with them it is not a question of many working hours, but how much endurance for constant work of the most trying nature, with most often, not more than five hours sleep in the twenty-four. As to their duties, they are of all orders. First comes the attempt to make the patient go to a hospital, very often unsuccessful because the poor have a terror of all hospitals. Even a rheumatic or partially paralyzed patient, who must necessarily be neglected, since friends and relatives are fighting for a living, will refuse obstinately. A dressmaker who had become helpless from inflammatory rheumatism said, I don't care. I'd rather die here at home when the time comes than at the hospital, where they cut you open before the breath is fairly out of your body. That's the way a friend of mine was served up last year, just cut right up. Her folks didn't know no better than let her be took there, and after her death, which I suppose was helped along by the black bottle, them doctors, without asking leave of nobody, just slashed away at the poor thing, and then they botched her up again, and made a great pucker in the seam, such as I wouldn't allow a little prentice girl to make. When the nurse encounters such opposition as this, she has simply to do the next best thing, and this is the comment of one of them on the question, what are the duties of a missionary nurse? Duties? Well, besides giving medicine and sticking on plasters and taking temperatures, I sometimes have to cook and wash and scrub and beg. Scarcely a day passes that I don't boil gruel and broil chops for sick people, and often I have to roll up my sleeves and wash dishes or scrub the floor. Then I may have to go to some depository where benevolent persons send contributions and present a petition for sheets or blankets, or whatever else is needed among my patients, whom I sometimes find lying on piles of rags. My salary? 
$40 the first month, the month of probation, and afterwards $50 a month. If you were to go the rounds with me some day, I think you would say I earn it. Take today. I have this case of rheumatism I mentioned, and a consumptive patient whose eyes I expect to close tonight, and I have promised to be with her at the last. Then I have a cancer to dress, a bone fell into poultice, several cases of malaria to look after, for they need quinine every hour in the day and cannot be trusted to take it by themselves. And these are only a few of the cases. Do I have contagious diseases among my patients? Some days, but one thing I haven't. There is not a case of hypochondria in my care. It is the uptown nurses who have to deal with that kind of thing. My patients haven't any time for it. Is there a moral tucked away in that statement? My opinion is that there is, and a strong one. Into the dispensary came one day a tall man, gray-haired, and with a face where sharp experience had graven deep lines far removed from the wrinkles of old age, whose type is most often seen there. Patient, intelligent eyes looked out under the heavy brows, yet eyes that could flash at will, and everything indicated fallen fortunes, as to which their owner would always keep his own counsel. He looked long and earnestly at the head physician. It was plain there was something to be asked, but evidently he was measuring the doctor before stating his case. He had come and gone there for a fortnight, describing a case and taking the medicine for a crippled child who he said could not come. He declined a visit from the visiting physicians, and the ailment was so simple that they did not press the matter. On this day he had come late and lingered till he saw the head physician take his hat. Then he quickly followed him, and when they were outside the door, said, Doctor, I cannot have the others, but I implore you to come with me for a minute. It will not take you more. Why didn't you tell the visiting physician? The doctor began, but stopped as he saw the man's imploring eyes and felt something more than ordinary need. The man gave one grateful look as the doctor followed, then walked on swiftly to a street but a little distance away, and turning the corner went up the stairs of one of the better order of tenement houses. At the top of the stairs he paused. I have no fee, he said. There is nothing left to give, but I will work it out if any work can be found. He opened the door as he spoke and held it open for the doctor, who entered and looked around in dismay. Save for the bed, one chair, and a kerosene lamp over which the man had evidently been cooking something, the room was absolutely bare. On the bed lay the emaciated form of a woman, the skin drawn tightly over the cheekbones, and the face ghastly with suffering. By her side lay the crippled child, with glassy eyes, and the same pinched, drawn look. The doctor bent over them for a moment, and then fiercely exclaimed, They are starving, man! What do you mean by leaving them to die like this? Are you mad? I have begged for work, and there was no work for me, said the man in heartbroken tones. I have pawned all there was to pawn till there is nothing left. My wife and child are dying, I know, and I must live till they are dead. The rest will be easy enough. The doctor descended the stairs and came back in great leaps, bearing restoratives and a can of milk he had snatched from the hand of one of the dispensary patients met at the foot of the second flight. The child's teeth were clenched, but after the first spoonful had been forced between them, she drank freely. The mother was more difficult to rouse, but soon she too had taken enough medicine and food to lose the death-like look, and then the doctor wrote a line or two and handed them to the man. Go round to the dispensary, he said, and give this to Dr. K, and then come back and tell me what this means. They must both go to the hospital. A faint cry came from the woman, who in a weak, almost inaudible voice exclaimed, Oh, not that. Let us all die if we must, but here, together, not there. I will not be taken away. You shall not be without your own consent, said the doctor soothingly and then waited quietly till the man returned, bringing the wine for which he had been sent. It was impossible to move her till she was stronger, for any attempt might end the feeble life. To provide actual necessaries and leave her in the hands of a missionary nurse was the only course, but the father protested that no one must come, and that he would do it all. He staggered from weakness even as he protested, and the doctor, who had diagnosed his case as of the same order, caught him as he fell forward. 
The nurse arrived while he was still unconscious and sped away again to the dispensary to get necessary supplies. A cot was brought and set up, and the haggard creature laid upon it, and plied with food and restoratives, till at last strength came back, and then the full story was told. He was an Italian refugee, a former companion of Garibaldi, a man of highest culture who had married an English wife, and who had come to America in hope of some day returning home with better fortunes. A fine linguist, he had taught languages successfully, till an operation, necessitated by some cancerous growth on the tongue, had ended this. Then he had tried many things, for none of which he had much fitness, hoping always that he might obtain a position with some publishing firm where his perfect command of English would make his other tongues more available. Such place had been promised, and then failed, and he had done odd jobs on the docks, shoveled coal, answered countless advertisements, and nursed the invalid wife whose courage still remained in spite of ever thicker and thicker disaster. She had grown worse day by day and the child with her, so that he was forced at last to remain with them. Every article of furniture and clothing had been pawned. Both had a morbid terror of making their condition known, and so it had gone on till the struggle was nearly over for all of them. I studied your face many a time, the poor man said one day with grateful eyes on the doctor's face, but I could not speak. It is too late now. On the contrary, it is never too late, the doctor made brisk reply. You must eat and get strong, and then we will see about work. I know of some for you, so hurry and get well. The sad eyes brightened. Work is all I want, he slowly said, and then was silent. A week later, the child died, a merciful release for the twisted little body which had never known anything but pain, and in another week the mother had followed her. When the undertaker came to measure for the second coffin, the father sprang at him with a cry like some wild animal robbed of its young, and would have murdered him but for the doctor and nurse, who threw themselves upon him. Together they bound his hand with a strip of the sheet till a straight jacket was brought, and he was carried a raving maniac to Bloomingdale. There he is still, quiet and gentle, but hopelessly insane, never complaining, but certain that his wife and child will soon come for him, and sitting all day within sight of the door at the end of the ward. When night comes, he goes to his rest silently, but with returning daylight he resumes his ceaseless vigil, always watching at the door, and so his days pass and will continue to pass till the door above opens, and he enters the country where... Things that have grown uneven are made even again by his hand. End of chapter 15。Chapter 16 of Darkness and Daylight, or Lights and Shadows of New York Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Piotr Nater. Darkness and Daylight, or Lights and Shadows of New York Life. Chapter 16 by Helen Campbell. Life Behind the Bars. A Visit to the Tombs. Scenes Within Prison Walls. Ray of Light on a Dark Picture. There are still living a few old New Yorkers who, as children, played about the collect pond. This was a pretty sheet of water about which young people wandered in summer evenings, though it was a long walk from the most thickly built-up portion of the city, then below Fulton Street. From the pond to the North River was swampland, through which ran a little rivulet on a line with the present Canal Street. For years this pond supplied most of the drinking water for the city, but as it served also as sewer and dumping ground, it became plain to the city fathers of that day that something must be done about it. There was strenuous opposition. There always is opposition to the most self-evident need for reform. But the fathers had their way, and the filling up of the pond began. It was a slow process, and required not only countless loads of soil, but anything and everything that could find place on the dumping ground, from old shoes to ashes and sweepings, over which the rag-pickers of the day kept careful oversight. Work as they would, it remained practically a marsh about which malaria under another name lingered persistently, and which the doctors insisted was the cause of most of the ailments current. 
The filling began in 1817 and went on with intermissions until 1837, when it was chosen as a site for the new city prison, the old one farther down having proved entirely inadequate. Why this spot was chosen, unless to get rid of the prisoners as quickly as possible, no one knew. The plans for the new prison meant not only an enormous expenditure of money, but one of the stateliest of buildings, probably the purest specimen of Egyptian architecture out of Egypt, and magnificent in proportions. Yet this building, occupying an entire block, is dwarfed and made insignificant by being sunk in a hollow so low that the top of the massive walls scarcely rises above the level of the Broadway, hardly more than a hundred yards distant. Constant anxiety attended the building. The soil was so marshy that the walls settled, and though the foundations were much deeper than ordinarily laid, it was regarded as very doubtful if they would ever support the weight of the mass erected upon them. By 1840 the work was complete, and save for the darkening of the stone by time, no change has taken place. It is of solid granite, 253 feet long by 200 deep, and appears as one lofty story, the windows being carried from a point about six feet above the ground up to beneath the cornice. The main entrance on Center Street is reached by a flight of dark stone steps, which lead to a portico, massive and gloomy, supported by four enormous Egyptian columns. The other three sides are broken by projecting entrances and columns. Its name of the tombs was the natural outcome of the feeling of all who looked upon it. Year after year, successive grand juries condemned the building as totally unfit for its purposes, and even today an occasional remonstrance is heard. It was built to accommodate about 200 prisoners, but double that number are now confined in it. Armed with the permit without which there is no admission for the curious, one is passed through the heavy gate at the north, at which an old warden keeps guard. From half-past ten in the morning to half-past one in the afternoon are the hours for visitors, and a motley crowd assembles as the hour approaches, most of them bearing brown paper bags and bundles designed for the consolation of the prisoners. These are examined to see that they contain no hidden files or anything forbidden, and are delivered later. Each man, as he passes in, is examined at the inner gate, and each woman by a woman who sits just inside a little room. One is tempted to pause here and watch the row. Now and then comes a weeping mother, all unused to such company, or a wife who will not believe the punishment of her loved one deserved. Once within, the visitor finds himself in a large courtyard, and facing a second prison built in the center, 142 feet long by 45 feet deep and containing 150 cells. This is the male prison, quite separate from that for females and connected with the outer building by a bridge, which long ago received the name of the Bridge of Size. Over it walked all condemned prisoners on their way to their death, the gallows meeting their eyes as they passed out into daylight. In capital cases, the putting up of the gallows was delayed to the last, and the muffled sound of the hammers reached the murderer in his cell and stirred a ripple of excitement among the other prisoners. Such windows as look out upon the courtyard were obstructed by great sheets hung before them, and the scaffold was immediately taken down when all was over. Over that bridge they come, said the old warden to me on the occasion of a recent visit, nodding his head as he pointed. Fifty year nearly I've seen em come. That row of cells behind you is murderer's row, and there used to be an iron cage where they put em ten days before the sentence was to be executed. There they put every man as was to be hanged, and they gave him a brand new suit of clothes, and all to eat he wanted, but they stopped that a good while ago. Then they kept him in his cell, and watched him day and night, to keep him from suiciding, maybe. And when the time come, they tied his hands, and they tied his feet, and they put the black cap on his head, and the rope round his neck, with the noose a-hanging down behind, and he come along, and it went flop-flop, flop-flop, as he come, and then... That will do, I exclaimed. I do not want to hear any more. The old man's eyes opened with surprise. Why, there's many a one would give a V any day, yes, and more, too, to get in and see it, but they ain't allowed. 
You wouldn't, maybe, but most would, and it's a sight to see. One leaves the yard gladly, passing into the male prison, which contains a lofty but narrow hall with four tiers of cells opening upon the floor and three iron galleries, one above the other. The cells opening from them are intended for two prisoners, but often hold three, and all are watched by two keepers for each gallery. Each tier has its special use, the ground floor cells generally containing the convicts under sentence. On the second floor are the prisoners, charged with grave offenses, murder, arson, etc. Prisoners arrested for burglary, grand larceny, and the like are on the third tier, and light offenders have the top floor to themselves. The boys' prison is on the center street side, and on Leonard Street is the women's prison, where fifty cells prove insufficient for the demand made upon them. The large hall on the Franklin Street side, once used as a station house for the police of the district, is now known as Bummer's Hall, and in it are confined the tramps, vagrants, and persons arrested for drunkenness in the streets. They are kept there until the morning after their arrest, when they are brought up for trial. The center street side contains also the offices and residence of the warden, the police court, and the court of special sessions. Directly over this entrance are six large cells for the use of those who can afford to pay for them, and forgers, defaulters, and prisoners from the higher walks of life wait here till their cases are determined. All who enter from whatever rank are under the charge of the warden, two deputy wardens, a matron, and a sufficient force of keepers to watch and guard the prisoners. As at the workhouse, most of the work is done by prisoners, thirty boys being constantly employed. The place is spotlessly clean, all scrubbing being done by the boys, while others are busy in the kitchen, from which abundant rations are sent out. Changes of clothing are supplied by their families, or, if too poor for this, the city furnishes them. Each one must walk for an hour a day in the corridor outside his cell. In short, the routine is that of the ordinary prison anywhere in the country, and in spite of the unhealthy location of the tombs, its sanitary arrangements are so good that no case of disease has ever originated in it. For over thirty years, one woman, Mrs. Flora Foster, was matron for the women's and boys' prisons, and took general charge of the multitude of babies brought in with drunken or criminal mothers. Long habit had made her an almost unfailing judge of possibilities for her charges, and many a boy owes his first chance in life to her efforts and encouragement. The most violent were made calmer at her approach, and she had unbounded influence over the women who came under her care. There were many, for fifty thousand prisoners passed through the tombs in the course of a year. In spite of constant vigilance and the immense strength of the building, escapes have sometimes taken place, the most noted of these being that of the murderer Sharkey, who escaped in women's clothes provided by his wife, who also gave him her visitor's ticket that he might pass the guards. Since this feat, no prisoner has ever succeeded in evading them, and the number of escapes altogether is hardly a dozen. An hour in the tomb's police court is full of strange experience. Here may be found any morning during the year a pitiable array of poverty-stricken men, women, and children in what are called the prison pens. Arrested for minor or greater offences, all are promiscuously mingled, and no physiognomist could detect, after a night's lodging in the dreary cell of a station-house, the slightest difference between the innocent and the guilty. One by one they are arraigned before the magistrate, who calmly listens to the tale of the policeman, the only witness, perhaps, and excuses or condemns, as the case may be, with apparently the utmost nonchalance. Poverty is here a great factor in the determination of a case, for the very poor have no friends, not even the saloon-keeper or the politician, and influence on their behalf is an unknown quantity, for the simple reason that there is no probability of value ever being received for it. The justice who sits here knows his offenders so thoroughly that he is a terror to every old sinner who comes before him, each one of whom knows that the transgressions of his past are recorded in that unfailing memory, and are likely to be laid before him. Nine o'clock is the time fixed for opening court, but it is tolerably certain one will have to wait half an hour or so, nor is the time lost, 
for under the watchful eyes of half a dozen policemen the hall with its rows of wooden seats fills up with friends of the arrested prisoners who often are to be the witnesses for or against shyster lawyers or a class peculiar to the tombs ready to defend a prisoner for anything they can get from fifty cents to as many dollars wander up and down the room eyeing the people and sending out those who may be persuaded into accepting their services here are women with black eyes in fact the woman without a black eye is in the minority tramps from the contingent in city hall park small boys who steal in under the pretense of belonging to the prisoner and who watch the proceedings with delight chinese and all sorts of conditions of men the justice enters swiftly and silently and is in his place before anyone has noticed him the doors of the bummers hall open and struggling one by one come the row of offenders chiefly drunk and disorderly cases in which assault and battery play a large part near us sits a respectable-looking woman certainly six years old who tells her story to all near her in fact this is one of the peculiarities of the place each one in turn and sometimes half a dozen together recite their autobiography and in some cases take pride in the number of times they have had occasion to appear here not so with yonder woman who wraps her shawl close about her and looks around distrustfully as well she may for at her back and moving by slow degrees toward her is the husband against whom after forty years of endurance she has at last decided to enter complaint he has slept in the gutter it is plain and even now he believes that if he can argue with her a little the complaint will be dismissed as he edges toward her the policeman appears listens for a moment and then hustles him off while the old lady says with many sniffs and sobs it do seem a bit hard but he's drunk up all the bits of things over and over and i've no strength to keep on earning money for him to throw into the gutter he is the best of men when he's sober and never laid his hand on me but he isn't ever sober hardly and so it do come hard inside the rail a dozen women look appealingly toward the justice or defiantly toward the audience case after case is called with a promptness amazing to the beholder and dismissed with equal celerity here a child so small that he has to be lifted up for a moment of observation by the judge there old hags some of them lifelong offenders to-day there were three who could easily have sat for the witches in macbeth two were lame one had only a single eye and all had been in the gutter and bestowed scratches and bites freely on each other and on the policeman who brought them in sure tis the hate i was drunk with judge your honour said the one-eyed woman do you think now judge your honour i'd be drinking after all the warnings i've had from you three months on the island was the only answer she received and she was led out shaking her matted lock and swearing vengeance when out again five italians came up in a group one minus the end of his nose he declined however to press the charge saying it was purely a friendly affair and a woman nearby confirmed his statement go into baxter street if you want to know the truth she said they are always at showing at each other's noses and none of them minds and mourns some minds a black eye there were sadder cases than these young girls homeless and betrayed children whose only home had been the streets sailors still sodden with drink beaten and robbed with no knowledge of by whom and for each and all swift justice did its work first offences are dealt with leniently but there is no time for investigation of special ones no philanthropist goes down to the tombs for the purpose of hearing the tales of destitution and misery daily rehearsed there no society takes sufficient interest in humanity to institute an inquiry into and prevent this daily cloud over the brightness of civilization no church by its authorized offices visits the filthy dens and rookeries of the sixth and tenth wards or the courts and prisons where the victims of necessity are condemned and punished and attempts a reformation of the evils found there for six years one woman who has persistently shrunk from notice has done here a work never before undertaken there by a man or woman in these six years she has given bail for hundreds of cases the sum now amounting to over fifty thousand dollars moved to it in the beginning by a knowledge of the utter friendlessness of many who were wrongfully charged 
or had been tempted and fallen for the first time, she appeared in her first case in behalf of a lad of nineteen who had sought unavailingly for work and in despair at last attempted suicide. Bail was given, work found, and the gratitude of the lad, now a successful businessman, was so stimulating that Mrs. Schaffner, in spite of her retiring temperament, kept on. Today she is allowed free access to prisoners, and her almost unerring instinct, added to experience, makes it impossible for them to deceive her. Each day she visits the tombs, and once a month gives a day to Sing Sing. Why will not more do so? she said in her pretty German English, her soft voice and gentle eyes hardly indicating the strength of character and endurance she has shown. Do you know it is elegant work? Yes, elegant work. Each day you see some fruit. Because of that there is nothing like it. I wonder often why rich people, who say there is nothing to do, do not do this and have much pleasure. I care not for institutions. I like better to see my individual in the face and do what I can when I have listened and made up my mind. It is all kinds I help. Yes, all kinds. Black, white, Chinese, all nations. And never but once did any deceive me, and he was my own countryman. Was not that a shame? But I go on. And the district attorney, who said first, Madame, you're crazy, say now, Madame, I thank you for much help, and may the Lord send more like you. This is different, you see, but he has reason, for always I know if the prisoner be innocent or be guilty. And, oh, such tales I hear, it would break hearts to hear such tales if there were no help, but always there can be a little. This and the work of the old matron rank side by side in wisdom and discrimination, and save for this there is no other bright spot for the tombs whose grey walls are a menace to the criminal yet most often an unheeded one till the clutch of the law is felt and the judge pronounces sentence ludlow street jail is quite as widely known and as the county prison for new york has sheltered many notable prisoners everyone arrested under process issued by the sheriff of the county of new york is brought here and majority being arrested for debt prisoners from the united states courts are also sent here and all alike suffer extortions of every kind in spite of spasmodic attempts to better the condition of things bribery and corruption seem inseparably associated with this prison no favors are granted unless paid for liberally and even where lawful charges are known it makes no difference in the case of a debtor who wishes to give bail he is taken by the deputy sheriff to the sheriff's office, from whence he sends for any friend likely to become a surety. The law allows him a reasonable time to find bail, but to leave the office he must fee a deputy enormously, the amount demanded being in proportion to the prisoner's probable means. So it goes on through every item of the process, from signing the bond to the fee of the notary. Periodical exposure of these and other kindred practices have had thus far small effect on the system, and the prison has the uninviable notoriety of being the center of shameless corruption of every order. Smaller courts are held at many points, and the stranger often wanders into Essex Market Court or that at Jefferson Market, watching the miserable creatures, the supply of which is perennial, and who are gathered up nightly at all the points where vice congregates, whether east or west. The cells at these stations are filled with men, women, and boys, the latter taking every lesson in crime from their elders. For all the courts the story is much the same. One alone owns an alleviation, hardly possible for the rest, and certainly unique of its kind. At the Prince Street station is a beautiful water spaniel, the property of one of the men, which enters into the life with the greatest spirit. A young Italian bootblack has taught him many tricks, and he obeys with the docility of a well-trained child. He abhors solitude, and if left alone with the door closed upon him, he rises on his hind feet and diligently paws the knob of the door to the room where the reserve force sit till it turns, when he marches in, wagging his tail triumphantly. A recent exploit made him a member of the force, and added the policeman's shield to his collar. Leo does not make friends readily, and follows no one in the street but the sergeant and one of the policemen. 
on one of the policeman's rounds about nine o'clock one evening he heard the loud cry of stop thief and saw a burly negro spring from some steps and run along the street the policeman started after him but leo was far in advance and soon buried his sharp teeth in the leg of the thief oh lord take off the dog take off the dog i give up groaned the negro dropping his plunder and dancing with pain the policeman released him though with some difficulty and leo walked by his side to the station and stood looking on gravely till the prisoner had been committed to his cell he's got so as he smells out a thief soon as he sees him said a shrewd-looking old man who stood by the other day as the dog went through his tricks it wouldn't never do turn him loose in society again for in a city like new york he'd make damaging exposures see i wish then there was ten thousands like him said his companion explosively there ain't a spot in the city but what needs detectives and i'm sick to my marrow of all the horrors i've seen why don't the lord descend on it and make an end because when all's said and done there's a heap of good in it and that's the summing up for most things said the old man and went his way more criminals pass each year before the recorder smith than any other judge in the world he is a hard-working painstaking and withal tender-hearted judge the visitor to his courtroom on a busy day is astonished at the rapidity with which he dispatches business and one who knows nothing about his methods is led to believe that his only object is to get through with his work no matter what becomes of the prisoners it is the greatest mistake one could make said the recorder i have to hurry my work for my court is overcrowded but never in all my experience on the bench have i been so hurried that i could not give all the time and attention that was necessary to the prisoners when a man or a woman comes up before me whom i have never seen before whose looks or manners give indication that they are not really criminals at heart i suspend the judgment in their case until the matter is thoroughly investigated of the scores of cases of men who have come before me and pleaded guilty not knowing really what they were doing but anxious to get out of further trouble by taking a sentence and hiding themselves away in prison i recall one that i shall remember as long as i live i could not forget it if i would for the man in the case writes to me regularly comes to see me when convenient and never ceases to thank me for my good offices in his behalf i was sitting on the bench one morning and has disposed of a number of ordinary cases when the court officer presented me a respectable-looking man of about fifty charged with burglary i looked at him very closely and he seemed to be a little above the ordinary grade of prisoner there was something about his face that irresistibly drew me to him he looked me steadily in the eye without brazen effrontery and seemed only too anxious to have sentence passed upon him and get into prison you are charged with burglary my good man i said to him what have you to say he looked up at me in an innocent way and with tears streaming down his face said huskily nothing i am guilty do you know the meaning of that word guilty i asked him yes he replied fully i broke into my employer's store i stole his jewelry i pawned it and that is all there is of it pass sentence upon me if you will send me to prison and let not my shame be visited upon my wife and daughter have you any counsel i asked him no was the reply i have no counsel and need none i am guilty sentence me now the whole thing was so unusual that i determined to remand him you may go back to prison i said to him and remain there for a week meantime think over what you have done you are not called upon to say you are guilty and if you do say so know that there is no alternative but state prison burglary is a heinous offence better go back think it all over change your plea send for your friends and see if something cannot be done for you when court was over i called in one of my detectives told him to go to the head of the firm where this man worked and whose store he had broken into and tell him that i wished to see him then i sent for the poor man's wife and little by little the story came out the poor woman between her sobs and tears told it all her husband was a loving hard-working industrious man he had only one object in life 
his love for his daughter. She had a consuming ambition to become a great musician. He had spent all the money he had made on her musical education, and had really kept himself not only poor, but in debt by so doing. It seemed that she had almost gained her object, and become not only a good singer, but a fine pianist, when she went to her father and said that it would be necessary for her to take another course of instruction with a distinguished teacher. The poor man had not a dollar in the world. He was only a working man on small wages, and the money required for this instruction was something that he could not hope to get in the natural course of events. He brooded over it for a few days, talked with his wife about it, and finally, after many ineffectual efforts to raise the money in other directions, he came home one Saturday night with the desired sum in his hands. He was as happy as a schoolboy. His face was all aglow, and his eyes danced with joy. He kissed his daughter, gave her the money, and told her to go on. Success was now assured. The young woman never for a moment asked where the money came from. But after the frugal supper was over, the good wife took her husband aside and asked him where he got the money. He evaded her for a long time, and finally, suspecting that he had not come by it honestly, she charged him directly with obtaining it by false means or foul. Hour after hour she pleaded with her husband to tell her the truth. He steadfastly refused. At last, at midnight, he could stand it no longer, and in an agony of despair he broke down and told her that he had broken into the establishment where he had worked, taken some valuable jewelry, and pawned it. The poor wife was half crazed. But she was a brave woman, and she told him between her sobs that although she valued her daughter's education and happiness in life, she could not be his partner in crime. She prevailed upon him to accompany her, and that night those two unhappy people walked the streets until they reached the home of the senior member of the firm whose store the men had robbed. The woman nervously rang the bell, and they waited until at last the door was opened. Once inside the house, she bade her husband tell all, and he explained with bent head how the theft had been committed, and told where he had pawned the stolen goods. The wife handed over the money realized on the property, asked the employer to redeem his goods, and forgive her husband. You would think that any man would have been touched by the poor woman's sturdy honesty and bitter tears in that midnight hour. But this employer was unmoved. He deliberately called a policeman and had the man taken to jail. The merchant recovered his goods, and the law was about to take its course with the criminal when I, sitting on the bench there, was convinced that there was a story behind it all, and I decided to investigate the case. I shall never forget how eloquently that poor woman pleaded for her husband that day in my presence, and how stubbornly the unfeeling employer, who sat opposite to her, demanded, with true Shylock persistence, the last pound of flesh. I suggested to the merchant that the case was a peculiar one, and, it seemed to me, presented an opportunity for mercy as well as justice. "'You had better decide,' I said to him, "'not to prosecute this poor fellow.' He has never before been accused of any crime. He has worked faithfully for you for many years. He is deserving of some consideration from your hands, and this woman, his wife, who was strong enough to right a wrong at any cost to herself and family, is deserving of her husband's presence and support in her declining years. The woman thanked me, and had hardly done so, when the merchant arose, and in an angry tone said that he was determined to make an example of this man. He insisted that prisons were for just such persons as he, and that the sooner he was placed there, the better. I allowed him to talk in this way for perhaps ten minutes, and I listened carefully to all he said. I don't believe, I replied, that this man intended to commit a crime. As a judge, I am empowered to suspend sentence. I shall call him up in court tomorrow, shall tell him I have investigated the matter thoroughly, and shall suspend sentence in his case. Now, this is the strangest part of the story. The man was brought before me the next morning and withdrew his plea of guilty. I suspended sentence. Some good people that I knew obtained enough money to enable his daughter to finish her musical education, and she is now well known in New York's best musical circles. I obtained a position for her father as purser on one of the outgoing steamships, 
and he is as honest as the day is long, and as grateful as a man can be for the service I rendered him. While his employer has since been brought up in another court in this city for fraudulent practices, and narrowly escaped state prison for his crime. End of chapter 16「Chapter Seventeen of Darkness and Daylight of Lights and Shadows of New York Life This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by John Brandon Darkness and Daylight or Lights and Shadows of New York Life Chapter Seventeen by Helen Campbell Lurking places of sin, face to face with crime, cellular haunts and underground resorts of criminals, the story of Jim, an ex-convict. Now the least surprising experience of one who has learned to know the slums in every aspect is the flat denial of most New Yorkers that they exist save in the slightest degree. All exaggeration, every word of it, said an energetic businessman to me only the other day, one who had every day of his life walked down to his office, his way lying within a stone's throw of some of the worst sights New York has to offer. Two minutes from Broadway would take him into the Great Bend on Mulberry Street, and his own place of business has at its back a nest of tenement houses, one at least with a cellar which has harbored many a criminal. Nevertheless, like many another, he knows nothing of the wretched life, existing almost under his eyes. Of the same mental order are certain good women, long members of the Charity Organization Society, but so absorbed in the work of their pet institution as to be quite insensible to any form of life going on without the scope of their somewhat limited vision. They, too, think this talk about the misery of great cities must be drawn from fancy, and deny that fact as any such picture to present. But he who has once seen fairly, face to face, these dens in which not only vice, but the extremest poverty often take refuge, has learned what can never be forgotten, and knows that no words can tell in full the horror that dwells in this darkness. Michael Dunn's sad gray eyes used to look pitifully at anyone who crawled into the Water Street Mission, just out from prison or released from the island, without friends or money, and with no knowledge of where to turn for help. He knew what it meant and one by one he gathered these forlorn souls about him, till the mission had no more room, and he established himself almost directly opposite, in a tumble-down tenement, a wooden house whose roof caving in near the ridgepole, and bulging at most other points, showed what years had gone since ground was first broken for its foundation. Here they came for years, of all ages, types, and conditions, and Michael found such work as he could for them, knowing well that Satan finds some mischief still for idle hands to do. Here hoary old offenders sat side by side with boys still in their teens, and made brooms or wove baskets, and as the story went out that there was a place where all could come, the numbers grew. Here it was that Jim's shamefaced countenance showed itself the very day the law had loosed its clutch upon him. A companion had dragged him in here to listen and make up his mind what he had better do. It was plain that Jim knew all of misery that the slums had to offer, and when I saw him first he was still speculating as to what chance life had for him. Great blue eyes were Jim's, but looking out on men with deep suspicion as to motives and intentions. 
Underneath it all was a forlornness that seemed to demand help. Poor Jim, his closely cropped hair, told only too plainly what his last home had been, and he had decided to hide at Michael Dunn's till it had had time to grow a little. Old Michael's heart and sympathy went out to him, and Jim had made up his mind that Michael and the friends of his little mission could be trusted so far as he was willing to trust anybody. He sat there eyeing Michael narrowly. It was plain that he did not understand how any man could willingly tell such a story as Michael had to tell. But it was also plain that he was sore-hearted and thought that the world gives small chance to the small rogues while letting the great ones go scot-free. I'll show you where I used to hang out, Jim said to me one day. If you ain't ashamed to go round the block with one like me. She's had more than one of our sort for an escort, Michael said, with something that was half a smile and half a groan. And Jim led the way toward Front Street, just beyond Fulton Ferry. There's one of me, Holmes, he said pointing toward the big boilers that lined one side of Water Street. Many's the night I've slept in one of them, and a pal with me when I was a little un, and only up to pickin' pockets and such. Sometimes we made a good haul, and then we'd be flush and have a bed in a lodging house. But mostly I slept in packin' boxes or the soft corners of an alley, with a turn now and then in the boilers or water pipes. There wasn't any one to look after me, for me father was killed, and me mother died in hospital when I was that small. I'd no sense but to run away from all that tried to get me into asylum. Oh, but I dreaded them asylums, for they said you'd be whipped and starved and made to do whatever you hated most every day of your life. I wasn't going to have that, and so a lot of us settled that we'd manage it somehow, and keep clear of all that was after us. There was three of us, Dennis and Tom and meself, but they got longer sentences than me, and they won't be out for a good year yet. We had reached Peck Slip, with its network of street railway tracks, and the mass of trucks and heavy teams making their way over to Williamsburg. Here and there was a tall warehouse, but for the most part old buildings with every sign of age and decrepitude loomed up on all sides. Before one of the buildings, Jim paused. There's been deviltry enough in that basement to sink a city, he said, as he looked down into the darkness of what appeared to be an old-fashioned cellar. It was under a saloon, on that day closed, with a string of crepe floating from the door. Above the saloon was a cheap manufactory, and from the attic a frowsy woman looked down, who smiled amiably at Jim and beckoned to a sailor across the street. The steps were as old and decayed as the house, and shook under our weight as we descended into the cellar. There was no light save what entered from the doorway. A few empty barrels were piled up in one corner, and some planks in another, and on them was a little straw. It was inconceivable that any human being could have used this cellar as a lodging place, damp, moldy, and tomb-like as it was. Jim closed the door a moment, and the darkness as well as the smell of the tomb made itself felt. A ray of light stole under the door, and I confess I breathed more freely when it opened again. I beg your pardon, Jim said with a side look at my face, to see if I was frightened. I wanted you to see how it is when you settle down to it. It does very well when the water ain't up, but sometimes you get caught and there isn't much show. The tide comes in, you see, and you don't know just when it's going to do it. 
though it's safe enough to say it'll be on you whenever there's a big storm. There was one night, not so long before I went up, that we three was in here. Pat, who keeps the saloon above, had sworn we shouldn't harbor here. And he'd done his best to keep us out, even to nailing up the door come night. But he was no match for us, though he come near being this time, for he come down and screwed up the door after we was in. It was raining heavy, and all of us pretty full, and not much sense. And the first thing I knew, the water was on us, and I woke up half drowned and heard the others swearing and trying to come too. I made a rush for the door and found it tight against us, and then I felt round till I got on a plank, and there I floated around, and Dennis and Tom the same, till we got our senses enough to go for that door altogether. We put our shoulders to it and worked till it gave way, but we were near enough to dying like rats in a hole, and it would take a good deal to get me down there again, though the Lord knows where I am to bring up anyhow. We left the cellar and walked on, glancing into first one and then another of the same order. Some were given over to rag and junk men. Some were simply storage places. But about them all was the same aspect of age and mold and an all unwholesomeness. Heads and tails of fish and unsavory refuse of every order were underfoot. Dirt reigned supreme. Such dirt as the country happily never knows in which nature furnishes the smallest percentage, and man offers every type of filth that humanity at its worst can produce. In the network of narrow streets about this region may be found dens of pawnbrokers or junk men, and no end of bucket shops, where stale beer is sold by the bucket, all safe harbors for pickpockets, river thieves, and burglars. Murder stains are here, cockpits and rat pits, with all their accompaniments of brutality. Open spaces between front and rear tenements, where men can spar without fear of interruption by the police, and everywhere children watching with experienced eyes every fresh scene in the shifting panorama, ready to imitate at the first opportunity. This is the fourth ward but the description will apply equally to other wards with better reputation, but with few facts to warrant it. Jim knew every haunt, but he would not lead the way beyond the spot where he was born and where he had tried thieving in every form. Naturally, where the river is so near and ships lie at the wharves daily discharging rich freight from all nations, River Thieven shows its fascinations, and even Michael Dunn, with his thoughtful face and deep eyes, far removed, one would say, from any thought of evil, had a flickering smile, as he told me of one exploit, just preceding the final one, which sent Jim and his crew to Sing Sing Prison. You'd never believe the tricks of them, he said or how they'd scheme to get ahead of the police and night watchmen and all. Often a ship can't discharge in a day, and there'll be bags of coffee and spices and all that is worthwhile to run risk for, lying right there before their very eyes and inviting them to do what they can. The owners know most of the tricks. They're so on the watch you'd never think one could get a chance at an ounce of anything. But Jim here knows every inch of the river, as well as I used to know the Thames. Jim and his pals went after midnight when the watchman was getting a bit sleepy and rowed with muffled oars right under the pier, lying low to make sure no one heard nor saw him. 
The docks were all clear. It seemed so still and innocent-like that even a night watch might be off his guard a bit. And this watchman, what did he do but sit right down on his bags of coffee? A hundred and more of em, lying there with naught but a pile of sackin' over em. There he sat, nodding a bit, maybe, but keeping his eyes open for whatever might come. And there, under him, silent as the grave, Jim bored away with a big auger they'd brought with him, bored till the coffee came down in a stream, and that bag was pretty well squeezed. A policeman came along while the coffee was running, and Jim snickered, for he could hear him having a talk with the watchman. He'd bored another hole by that time, and when the talk above was over, there was five holes through the dock floor, and coffee enough in that boat below to set the boys up for a week of gambling and every deviltry they liked. It's that kind of tale that fires the young ones and makes them think there's no fun on earth like it, and they do like getting even with cops and owners and all that keeps riches to themselves. Put them into a reformatory and what one doesn't know another does. And they compare notes and experiences till there ain't a way of thieving, new or old. But they've got it at their fingers' ends. That's why I work to keep em separate where I can. But folks mostly thinks a reformatory must be the place for em. Bayard Street has certain notorious tumbler dives where stale beer is sold mingled with a whiskey so powerful that the drinker becomes drunk almost as he swallows it. In all this region, once quiet and reputable, gangs of young ruffians patrol the streets and make life a terror to the more respectable element. Born in these tenement houses, and with just enough education to enable them to read dime novels, their ideal is to pose as the bulldozers of the street, which is unfortunate enough to own them as inhabitants. A policeman would need the arms of a Hindu god and the legs of a centipede to overtake and capture them for all offenses committed. It is only when a specially flagrant one occurs that there is any attempt to deal with them. For the rest, officers wink at outrages that anywhere else in the city would send the offender to the island for months. A generation ago, it was the Bowery boy who filled this role, and who was the terror of all old ladies who found themselves in this once green and shaded thoroughfare of old New York. But the Bowery boy knew naught of the heroes of the cheap story papers, and was often at heart a very good sort of fellow, applauding every virtuous sentiment heard at the theater, and settling at last into a decent citizen. He was usually American, and here lies the principal difference between the rowdy of then and now. It is chiefly the children of the lowest order of emigrants who grow into the young ruffians, without sense of citizenship, save as they can, at twenty-one, sell their first vote, and who know liberty only as license. One case will stand for all. On Monroe Street in a recent day, spent in these regions, I at intervals encountered a boy of eighteen, brutal in face and form, walking always with the same lowering expression, and edging threateningly toward any younger or weaker boy encountered in his course. He vanished presently, and when I next saw him, an hour or so later, he was in the hands of two policemen, both of them bearing the look of having come through a severe conflict. The boy was swearing furiously, and lunging out now and then with his fists, 
only ceasing after a blow or two from the officers' clubs, justified here much more than in some cases where they have free use. Coming out an hour later from a tenement house on Roosevelt Street, one of the policemen, an old acquaintance, faced me. Who was that boy? I asked. The devil himself, save in your presence, returned his captor with great fervor. I've taken him up not less than twenty times with my own hands, and his lawyer always gets him off with the plea that I've a grudge agin him. Every one on the streets that he bulldozes is afraid to complain of him, because, you see, they don't know what he might take into his head to do to them, and so it's desperate work to get one to appear agin him. I did get him sent up once for three months, and he kept me after him for a year afterward, and no use. This time he's done for, for a while anyhow. There's an athletic club on Monroe Street, and he went in there and took up a pair of Indian clubs, and in two minutes had cleared out every soul in the room. The fellow in charge went for him and got a terrible cut over the eye, but he was gritty and held on, and the rest gave the alarm, and I had my turn at last. There ain't a boy on the street scared as they are of this boy that doesn't think it rather fine to copy after him, and unless he commits murder or tries his hand at a big burglary, I don't see but what it's got to go on. It does go on. On east or west side, gangs of young ruffians and sneak thieves prowl at night, or do their work boldly by day. They are proud of their profession, and welcome anything that does away with the necessity for continuous work at trade, or at anything else that would mean an honest living. At almost any point along the river front, though this applies chiefly to the East River, are haunts of thieves. It is on this side that the foreign population is massed, and it is from them mainly that we gather the army that fills prisons and reformatories. But on the west side is a region equally given over to vice, and even more dangerous at night time. Back of the Cremorne Mission on 32nd Street, where Jerry McCauley worked for the last years of his life, newer but hardly less crowded and pestiferous tenement houses are found in hundreds. Saloons are of a better order, but the whole region is one where open vice of every form has preempted the ground, and the decent citizen whom evil fortune has brought to this region and who must make a home here stands appalled at what his children must confront. Here, too, save for those who must live in it, is small belief given to the story of the horror of the life daily and hourly lived in this region. Only a block or two away the streets open directly from Fifth Avenue, filled with high-priced houses and owned by the prosperous businessmen of the city, who have little knowledge of what sites lie within the range of a ten minutes' walk of their palatial homes. The nearer the river, the nearer to hell was the saying of one of the roughs who had helped to make it true, and it is certain that the lurking places afforded by the great lumber and coal yards in the vicinity and the long stretches of street through which policemen make only an occasional round are all favorable to the criminal. It is on the west side that Hell's Kitchen has its place. A tenement given over to Italians of the lowest order, with a sprinkling of Portuguese. Here the knife punctuates and illustrates all discussion, and if murder is not done, it is no fault of the combatants, who at any hour of day or night may be heard engaged in their favorite pursuits. The neighborhood dreads yet takes a certain pride in its desperadoes, as an Italian village may plume itself 
upon the bandits near it. Little Italy is farther up, and inhabited by much the same class, but its quota of thieves seems less than that of other regions where the same life is lived. The preponderance of crime is farther down, and in the ward which has had the longest monopoly of it, thus making the rate an almost increasing one. It is not that means of many kinds are not taken to stem this tide of evil. Probably it is even not so great, proportionately, as in the not-so-remote days when the five points could not be entered without a policeman. But the tenement house, with its masses, is sending out a type as difficult to deal with, and for which we try cures after the harm is done, far more than we study methods of prevention. The police courts of the tombs, Essex Market, and all the points at which justice is supposed to be administered, will give the student of these problems many a point upon which to reflect. Every phase of human suffering is represented there, but chiefly and always, day after day, lads from sixteen to twenty, hardened and brutal beyond conception, form the chief source of supply and go up to the island only to return with seven devils more wicked than the first. How to reach them and bring without any change may well stir the thought of those who ponder over the future of a city, which must always in the nature of things deal far more with a foreign than a native population, and to whom Corruption is as yet a more familiar form of government than anything which can bring about righteous administration of law. End of chapter 17「Chapter 18 of Darkness and Daylight or Lights and Shadows of New York Life » This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Kinge, from Surrey, United Kingdom. Darkness and Daylight, or Lights and Shadows of New York Life, Chapter 18 by Helen Campbell Life on Blackwell's Island The dregs of a great city Where criminals, paupers and lunatics are cared for A convict's daily life Drinks our curse Long ago, in days just preceding the Second War with England, New York boasted of two or three famous gardens and certain orchards planted by sturdy Dutch burghers and yielding fruit impartially to their successors. From Kipp's garden, roses were plucked for Washington on his last visit to New York which he wore in his buttonhole, and which made the trees from which they came always thereafter a prized possession. From an orchard no less famous came early summer apples, harvest boughs, and later Newtown pippins, which were said to have a finer flavour in the orchard on Blackwell's Island than even in their native home at Newtown. Here on Blackwell's Island were to be found apple blossoms, bloom of cherry and peach and plum, tender green of grapevines for spring, and for autumn all manner of fruit, pleasant to the eye and good for food. Yet over all this was always a shadow, the forerunner of the darker cloud in time, to settle more heavily not only on this, but on the whole cluster of fair islands, which one by one have renounced orchard and homestead, and given place to buildings grim 
grey and formidable, and with each year more crowded and more numerous. Certainly no fairer spot could well have been chosen as a home, and the man whose story is the forerunner of many another of far sadder and more tragical order may have seen, as he walked under blossoming trees and remembered better days, men whose feet would tread the same paths and know the same regrets. The unending squabbles between Dutch and English for the possession of New York, the horror of the pious Puritan at the easy-going, beer-loving Hollanders, and the eagerness of both for every chance of despoiling the Indian, all form part of the history we study in youth, but fail to grasp as an actual reality till some experience puts life into the pages, and we suddenly see men living and breathing like ourselves. There is little record of why one Captain Manning chose to surrender to the Dutch the English fort of which he was commander, but choose he did, and marched out, leaving them in possession, making his own way as speedily as possible to England. He was compelled to return and meet his accusers, nor could any influence ward off this disagreeable duty. In time, the court-martial, called to inquire into the case, met and brought six charges against him, on each and all of which he was found guilty. Family influence saved his life, but there was no saving him from the deserved dishonour of cowardly surrender and he was sentenced to have his sword broken over his head to forfeit all rights of citizenship, and never to receive office under city or general government. This was the end of Captain Manning for all public life, and when the broken fragments of the dishonoured sword fell at his feet, he turned toward the spot which a few years before he had chosen as a retreat for his old age, and on the then nameless island hid his face from all men. Time dealt kindly with the offender. His stepchildren grew to womanhood, and one of them presently married young Robert Blackwell, to whom the old captain left the island, which had taken his name at the celebration of the wedding. For a hundred years the family continued in possession, but in 1828 the city brought it and put up cheap temporary buildings for various purposes, chiefly as almshouse and its dependencies. By 1850 it had become plain that more room was needed and the cornerstone of the present workhouse was laid. The penitentiary had preceded it, and the convicts themselves quarried the blue stone rubble and the heavy blocks of granite which form the sea wall and many of the buildings. Today the island holds the penitentiary, workhouse, almshouse, lunatic asylum, blind asylum, charity hospital, hospital for incurables, and for convalescents, with the numberless outbuildings necessary for the carrying on of work and feeding and providing for some 7,000 persons. To know the story of today's life on Blackwell's Island, one must take passage on the boat that leaves New York every morning with its crowd of prisoners visitors and officials. The air from the river is welcome after the throng on the dock through which one must push to reach the little window behind which stands a suspicious clerk whose business is to get as many in the next room in a given space of time as can be handed on. There one meets a stout and remarkably good-natured policeman 
whose face belies the sternness of his voice, and once beyond him must pass under the eyes of the old man who orders back the stray women who insist on going through the wrong gate. He does it philosophically, as if nothing else could be expected, and there is something of the same attitude in all the older officials. On the boat itself, one may see types of every form of poverty, crime and evil inheritance, and thus gain some sense of what those nearest them must almost inevitably be. Saturday is visitor's day, and the tub of misery, as the boat is called, swarms with friends of paupers, insane and convicts, most of them carrying fruit or small luxuries, and all busy in telling the tale of why they are there. The prison van, known as the Black Maria, rolls through the gate with its load of human misery, prisoners sent up to the island. The crowd make a rush forward to find the gate suddenly shut in their faces, but as the next van appears, rush again, no wise deterred by their experience. No, you don't, says the old gateman. They'll get out well enough without you. Certainly, they could hardly get out worse. The door of the vehicle is opened, and the waiting policeman receives the first instalment of women sent up for drunkenness or other offences. Two descend quietly, but a sound of jubilant singing within warns him that one at least is not yet over the carouse that brought her here. Some force is necessary before she can be induced to move, and then in the doorway appears a creature hardly human, it would seem, in woman's dress, but with little token besides of womanhood. A mass of foul, gutter-soaked rags, matted hair with a black eye and cut face, and on her feet one shoe and a man's boot. She lurches forward, still singing and shouting, and is followed by a young girl not over sixteen, gaudily dressed and with painted cheeks. Behind her come seven others of all ages, one a white-headed woman, muttering and cursing. What? Down again today? The policeman says to her. You've been quick. You only got out yesterday. She answers with a curse as she is hurried on with the rest to the room with barred windows where they sit till the island is reached. One violently insane patient is led along handcuffed and protesting and there are one or two milder cases of insanity. Then comes the van with the men whose cases have been judged at the various city police courts. The first, a boy of twenty, who has come from the country, and in his endeavour to see life ended by a three-week sentence to the workhouse. Behind him comes a man just emerged from a prize fight, who will need the hospital before his sentence can be worked out and then a row of young thieves of ruffians on their way to prisoners' cells in the penitentiary, who chafe and jeer each other as they pass into the hold. All about are the friends, some sympathetic, a few ashamed, but for the most part of the same order. One quiet little woman in black looks with sorrowful eyes at the brutal faces. Her own boy is on the island for thieving from his employer, and she has a little basket with fruit and some luxuries. The trip from the city requires but a few moments. On the journey, we pass Bellevue Hospital, whence come physicians, nurses and crowds of eager students, who sometimes to the number of 300 or more go over on the hospital boat to the clinics at the charity hospital, 
shouting and singing on the journey, after the manner of their kind. The prisoner's boat is manned by men detailed from the workhouse, and it soon appears that they rank many grades lower than the prisoners in the penitentiary, offenders in the latter, considering themselves aristocrats in crime, and those with the longest sentences and most aggravated offences highest in rank. The workhouse recruits are brawlers, bummers, rounders, anything that expresses the nature of the chronic tramp and shirker, or the habitual drinker. Their dirty brown uniform stamped on the back is less exhilarating, it appears, than the zebra-like stripes of the convict, and it is equally so among the women. Often there seems to be among the prisoner's friends a certain pride in the position, and women vie with one another in the number of times some relative has been sent up, and what he or she said to the judge who sentenced them. The cost to the city, cried a stout Irish woman, who had crowded a meek little woman from her place, and now looked around, prepared for battle. The cost to the city, is it? Sure, didn't I hear me own son say, him that was sent up for nothing but a bit of fun with the little Jew round the corner, that he'd heard the warden say, "'Twas but fifteen cents a head. More shame to them that starves the helpless, says I. They'd make their own grandmother's bones into broth and be licking their chops to think how nate they'd saved expense. Sure, the whole island's like that, responded a moon-faced woman near her. There's naught but spoon victuals in all the lunatic asylums, and them as in it fit to break in two with the hunger. Is them doctors, does it, to see what'll come next? They always standin' by with their books, a writin' and writin' down the best way of getting folks out of the world. What you talkin' about? broke in one of the deckhands, a workhouse prisoner, but evidently an unaccustomed one. We've had the asylums grab and it's better than we get in the workhouse. They feed em high to make em get well quicker and save the city expense. And there's many a one goes out cured. For my own brother is one and stands up for the doctors. It's a masher, maybe. You are on the bowery when you're out of your present suit, the big woman began wrathfully, but the whistle sounded. The deck hand hurried to his post and blocked the way against the pushing throng till the boat was made fast, holding himself meantime as if the word masher had recalled former glories. The prisoners marched off the boat a motley throng, a young girl hiding her face and weeping bitterly, a drunken woman and her baby sent up by her husband as a last resort, a man shrieking with the horrors and beating off invisible monsters with his clenched fists, a lot from a dance house in Water Street, arrested and sent up for disorderly conduct, and two wretched old hags in worse case than any of their companions. From below sounded piercing cries, and the masher shook his head. Them lunatics don't know what's good for em, he said confidentially to a frightened-looking woman who shrunk back as the cries went on. You don't need to be scared. He's in a close-shot ambulance that it took free to get him into, and it'll take more than free to get him out. He's worked himself up so. The cries went on. Shrieks for help, appeals for mercy, curses on those who were torturing him. Sounds that made the blood run cold, and yet they meant no more than the extremity of delusion. An old man with bent frame and heartbroken face turned for a moment and listened. I'd rather be him than me, he said, for he don't know where he going, and I do and he dragged on towards the almshouse, where his days were to end. To obtain entrance to the island at all, a permit is necessary from the commissioners of charities and correction. Even armed with this authority, one is eyed severely and distrustfully. Innocent-looking visitors have gone over, 
who developed afterward into reporters. Others, entering as cases, have presently shown the same features, and therefore officials are apparently on their guard, and permit and person are closely scanned. The buildings are of feudal character, turreted and battlemented, and of imposing size and height. Yonder is the charity hospital, with its thousands of human wrecks, none more piteous than its husbandless mothers and fatherless children. The old orchards are gone, but trees grew in their place, lining the long avenues or grouping here and there. Birds build and sing in the drooping branches, and doves brood and coo under the eaves, while the blue water flashes under the sunshine, and fresh wind sweeps through and over all. It is with the workhouse we have to deal at present, its central building flanked by two enormous wings, the northern for men, the southern for women. In the central part are the warders and physicians' rooms, the laundries, a great room or hall for chapel, but serving as a sewing room for the women and for many other purposes. A new kitchen with all modern appliances has lately been added, thus giving up the old one for more laundry space, all needed for 2,000 or more prisoners. 550 of whom are women, being provided for on the ground. Let us follow the workhouse group, who having left the boat, wait for a few moments under the trees, some looking about curiously, for it is their first time, others calling to one another acquaintance. A knot of women in the workhouse uniform come down the road on their way to a day's scrubbing in Bellevue. Their dresses are of heavy bed ticking. Deep cape sunbonnets hide their faces, but one woman pauses as she passes and looks at the men just forming into line and then at the group of women. God help us, she says. Drinks are curse. If it wasn't for the liquor, we'd all be fine men and women. Sure, why did I ever put the dirty stuff inside me mouth? The women march on silently toward the workhouse door and file into the office, where they are seated on long benches till registered, the same ceremony being gone through with for men and women. The register is a history of each case and evade as she may, each woman is finally pinned to something like fact. A white-headed woman, certainly seventy, makes her replies in a whisper. She was a lady once, the warden says. She took to drink when her husband died, and she's here most of the time. She went up last Monday, and here it is Thursday, and she's back again for six weeks. I ain't sure but what she might better be, let to drink herself to death and be done with it, for that's what it will end in. Ragged and filthy, with matted hair and bruised face, the old woman does not lift her white head as she follows the rest into the bathroom, where all are compelled to bathe and put on the uniform, their own clothes being rolled in a bundle with a numbered wooden tag fastened to it. Twenty minutes later, the transformation is complete, and we find her clean, combed, and generally made over, knitting stockings quietly as any old lady could, on one of the long benches of the general workroom. No talking is allowed, save at fixed times, and a certain amount of work is compulsory. Some two hundred women are employed in the sewing room, knitting stockings for the inmates, darning and repairing generally, and making garments for the Randalls Island children. The number of white heads is appalling, but they are chiefly old hags long given to drink, who began life in low dance houses, 
and are ending it in the gutter, knowing no decency save as it is forced upon them here. The floors are scoured as white as the deck of a man of war, often by most unwilling hands taking here their first lesson in care and order. When the art of scrubbing has been mastered, numbers of the women are detailed to other institutions, and the old inhabitants of the almshouse smile with satisfaction as they remember the past and all its miseries. For many a year, the respectable paupers, often through no fault of their own, were packed in with the order of criminal now sent to the workhouse, and forced to submit to an association degrading and offensive in every way. Drunkenness and petty thieving were the offences which took one there, and abuses of every order reigned. A board of ten governors distributed matters so evenly that no one was responsible, and the place was a pandemonium. At last an attempt was made to draw the line between vice and laziness. Comfort was the right of the helpless pauper, it was not the right of the tramp, the habitual drunkard, the rounder who used the island as a spot in which to recover from sprees and go out refreshed for a new one. The workhouse must be a house of industry to lessen pauperism, and thus every facility is given for working, and it has ceased to be a training school for the penitentiary. The long corridors are spotlessly clean, the wind sweeps through them and all taint flies before it. A savoury smell comes with it, and as we leave the workrooms a bell sounds, and from all quarters the women file silently toward the dining room. Here are long, narrow tables, each place with tin plate and spoon. By the door are enormous baskets of bread cut in hunches, each woman receiving one as she passes in, and looking jealously to see if her neighbour's happens to be bigger. The bill of fare is the same for men and women, cocoa and bread for breakfast, for dinner beef soup with vegetables twice a week, and salt fish and potatoes for Fridays, with salt beef and cabbage on other days, and on Sundays, boiled or roast beef. The kitchen is as spotless as every other portion of the building, and scrubbing is always going on. On the men's side, the shoemaker's shop has some thirty at work, repairing and making. The tailor's shop is equally busy, repairing being incessant, and an even more disagreeable order of work, since the clothes are often filled with vermin, which the ordinary bath has no power to extirpate. In the old days, flogging was the customary punishment, but the dark cell has taken its place, and is dreaded beyond any other form of punishment. All shirk work the moment a keeper's back is turned, or a friendly wall gives momentary shelter from his gaze. Wheelbarrows are dropped, hoers lean on the handles, and all regard even five minutes' respite as so much clear gain. The mass are hardly to be made over. If man or woman shows a desire to reform, or energy that may be turned in better directions, their chance is not here. It is quite plain, after a look or two at these faces, that for this world their chance is practically over. For most of them, the wonder is that they ever reform or even wish to. Born in the slums, and knowing evil from babyhood, the stronger natures gravitate naturally to the penitentiary, the weaker to this place which since the cornerstone was laid has seen over a quarter of a million inmates come and go. Nor is it likely that the number will lessen in spite of the amount of work done among them. 
To rescue the children is the chief task and the only effectual one. For the rest will be this alternation of debauchery and punishment till the end comes and the potter's field receives them. Five minutes' walk under an avenue of green trees and the high fence about the lunatic asylum is reached, the pass shown, and the great buildings stand full before one. Opposite the island, the pretty shore of Ravenswood slopes to the water's edge, and the stately buildings on Ward's Island are just beyond. The asylum itself includes three buildings the asylum proper, the lodge or madhouse, and the retreat. All the most violent cases are confined in the lodge, where visitors are never allowed. The centre of the main building, octagonal in form, is devoted to offices, a receiving room, etc., and the wards open out from this. The general arrangement is like those of most asylums, but there are no private rooms, and the beds in the dormitories are ranged closely together, with attendants stationed at intervals. In the convalescent ward, the end is fitted up as a reception room for friends, and is brightened with pictures and flowers. Above this is a ward for the milder cases, and here the patients gather, some fifty or so, a few knitting or sewing, but the majority idle. Except in the cases of melancholia, in which it is often impossible to rouse the patient, employment is insisted upon as one chief means of cure. Those in whom mild delusion is the difficulty are soon interested, and the amount of work accomplished is surprising. Two-thirds of the patients are foreign. Restraint is used only in case of necessity, and where rough handling or brutality of any sort occurs, it is the work of some untrained or angry attendant, the doctors protesting against such action even in extreme cases. The medical staff is supplied from Bellevue and is always composed of picked men. The resident physician is autocrat, but consults with the staff, always four or five in number. One attendant is allowed to every fifteen patients, four-fifths of whom are here for mania. The rest are idiots, paralytics, or temporarily insane from the horrors. From sixty to seventy are suicidal and require close watching. Now and then one makes a break for the river, and one or two have thus drowned themselves, but accidents are few. The form of entrance is much like that of the workhouse, so far as registration and bath are concerned. The patient who cannot be entered without a certificate of insanity is examined by the resident physician, who determines in what ward the patient shall be placed. For the most part, all save violent cases are assigned to the first till doctors and attendants have had time to judge the nature of the case. As many as possible are kept in the convalescent ward, which has privileges not allowed in others. Chronic harmless cases are allowed all possible freedom, and work in one of the shops or in the sewing room, always under observation. Basket weaving and mat making are favourite industries, and several of the patients crochet the beautiful Irish lace which is on sale in the visitor's room. Twenty acres of land belong to the asylum and are cultivated to the highest pitch by the patients. Flowers are everywhere and the greenhouse is another source of pleasure to the workers in it. The water supply flows through submarine pipes from the Croton Reservoir and is abundant. In the new cookhouse, soup is boiled in set kettles 
through which steam pipes pass and is carried to the dining room in huge pails. The dietary is a generous one. Soup predominates, but it is of the most nourishing order, and there is no limit as to quantity. Knives and forks are allowed to very few, and tin plates have proved of the best form of dish, as they cannot be broken. Over two hundred were dining together in perfect quiet, save for little outbursts here and there. Mush and molasses on Friday always rouses objection. The Irishman has never taken kindly to Indian corn in any form and resents being forced to use it. Till very lately there was small provision for amusement, but the attendant physicians realised long ago how vital a factor this was in cure, and begged for larger quarters. A large and airy hall has at last been built, and here at least once a week all who are not too excited by numbers gather together, dance, sing, or are given some light entertainment. The delight in this is a thing that passes on from one week to the next, and every scrap of ornament is treasured and put on for the occasion. More than one of the patients believe that the resident physician is God, and address prayers and sing hymns to him, this being the prelude to dance or game if he enters the hall. A maiden of fifty believes that she will ruin her complexion unless she wears continuously a mask cut from an old pasteboard box, and she waves a fan of the same material in the most stately manner. As in every asylum, there is one who believes herself the Queen of Heaven and daily receives dispatches from God, and one who owns it and everything in it, doctors included. Across the room sits a patient who receives guests affably and announces herself as the widow of President Garfield. A rag doll on the little table by her bed is one of her forty-five children, all of whom are grown up and doing well, most of them, she says, in fine positions. Near her is a little woman with twinkling blue eyes and a particularly merry laugh, who dances with delight, but pauses at intervals to whisper of the horrors she could tell if she were disposed. Murders by the score! Yes, by the score, she says, looking suspiciously about her. But the victims are thrown into the river at once, so that no one has to mention it. Take care, I shall be heard. And she laughs again and nods to her partner, a silent man, who chuckles to himself at intervals and moves his lips noiselessly. Another, at present, cut in pigeon wings, learned in his youth, has a nest of snakes in his stomach, and sits down suddenly, crying with a loud voice, Oh Lord, they're squirming again! It is a popular delusion that makes the test of insanity wild eyes and inflamed countenance. Often weeks pass before a patient says an irrational word, and save for some special delusion, many are perfectly competent for all ordinary affairs of life. Yonder, for instance, is an admirable tinker, when he can spare time. Most of it, however, is occupied in standing by the river, waiting for it to dry up, when he intends to cross and resume his station in society. Now and then he enters the office and applies for a pass, but when told that he must first get a Paris hat, he nods assent and goes out contentedly. One patient, mad from confirmed opium eating, shouted continuously for a coffin. For the love of God, bring a coffin. 
I've been dead ten days. What do you mean by not bringing a coffin? In the dead house sits an old patient who would rejoice to meet his wishes if he could. Corpses are his delight. One coffin fills him with satisfaction, and every additional one is a fuller joy. He will not leave them, but sits like an ancient and always good-natured ghoul, wishing he could pile the coffins higher. Under the trees sits a one-armed French soldier who believes he is one of Napoleon's marshals and that the emperor is to come again. An Irish philosopher, a graduate of Dublin University, and here from drink and opium, owns the island, but lends it by the day to the institutions. Tomorrow, maybe, and I'll have them all pulled down, he says reflectively. I'm thinking fine gardens might look better and more cheerful like, but there's no hurry. When the time comes, there's enough to carry out me orders and no bother to meself. There's no hurry at all, and I wouldn't be discommoding the doctors, not I. Down the long walk comes a group of women out with an attendant, all of them in the asylum uniform of Calico, less unpleasant than the bed-ticking dresses of the workhouse prisoners, a detachment of whom are working here. One little woman, walking with bent head, raises it suddenly and emits a piercing toot. She thinks herself a steam engine and whistles periodically to the rage of the others, who recognise her delusion but are wholly unconscious of their own. So it goes, and for each is the story of a blighted life and often the ruin of other lives closely bound to theirs. It is a pauper asylum, and fifty years ago all know what fate would have been theirs, and in some remote country towns is still the fate of one so afflicted. Here, in spite of the inevitable overcrowding and of a thousand difficulties, all that science can do is done, and the percentage of cures is a steadily increasing one. But for most, death is the best friend, and if the patient waiter in the dead house rejoices over a fresh coffin, he has better reason than he knows, for to its silent occupant no other release could have come. For the penitentiary, the story has practically been told in that of the workhouse. It is a more sombre building, has more rigid discipline, heavier labour, a more disgraceful uniform. It is the convicts who have built the heavy sea wall about the island and quarried the stone for most of the buildings. They mend and repair roads, and in as many ways as possible return a portion of the money expended in providing a place of punishment. The prisoner sent up to fill out a sentence goes through the same routine as all who enter any of the many institutions here. The register is his history in brief, and, like the portraits of the rogues gallery, is a standing menace to him. Yet hard as is the prisoner's lot, it is often the convict's first glimpse of regular life and decent food. He learns a trade, perhaps, for there are many occupations taught under the prison roof, and gains an appetite for the coarse but sufficient food. There is a chapel and a library, and all the alleviations at present allowed for a more humane view is now taken of the prisoner and his fate than even ten years ago. Reformation is more and more the thought, and the convict here, as elsewhere, reaps the benefit of the new view. But routine necessarily remains much the same. The long day of labour under guard, the long night after the hour has come in which all are locked in their narrow cells, 
is the same for all. There is stealthy communication and knowledge of each other that would amaze the keepers, who suspect but can seldom detect the method. Some learn to read and spend such spare time as is theirs in reading, and most of them leave the prison better in health than when they entered it. The prison has its own special staff of officers, from warden to doctors and chaplain, its infirmary and all the many outbuildings required for the maintenance of fifteen hundred and more prisoners. But its story is the story of all prisons, save the one or two fortunate enough to have at their head men who can count crime chiefly a disease and proceed to cure it. For speculation or fact as to this theory, there is no room here, but it is certain a new science is being constructed, and that all future methods with crime will be largely coloured by it. When the day comes, prevention will lead instead of follow, and we may believe that prison walls will contract rather than broaden, and fewer inmates look from the grated windows of the place of punishment. End of chapter 18「Nineteen of Darkness and Daylight, or Lights and Shadows of New York Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michelle Kinge from Surrey, United Kingdom. Darkness and Daylight or Lights and Shadows of New York Life, Chapter 19, by Helen Campbell. Heavenly Charities, Sister Irene's Mysterious Basket, Homes for Foundlings and Little Waifs. Near Lexington Avenue, between 68th and 69th Streets, stands the New York Foundling Asylum, an enormous building of simplest construction, the main portion six stories high, with various outgrowths which on examination proved to be hospitals and other departments connected with the institution. Possibly the visitor has come straight from the children's ward in St. Luke's Hospital, with its many free beds endowed by Sunday school classes, or by some mother in memory of her own little ones. Seeing the perfect care given there, one cannot but wonder how it fares with the myriad other babies who must be part of the misery that abounds in the swarming tenement houses of both the east and west sides. What is done with the hundreds upon hundreds of motherless, or worse than motherless, little ones? It is this asylum which affords one answer and which twenty-five years ago had no existence. Popular feeling was strongly against foundling asylums of any order. Their need had been often discussed by charitable workers, but it was felt in the various churches to which such work was long confined that if crime were shielded it must necessarily increase. Paris, with its enormous foundling asylums, was pointed to as an illustration of all we should most wish to escape, and thus little waifs fared as they could, room being made for them in homes and asylums ill adapted to such use, and where all such work was carried on at the greatest disadvantage. As usual, in these cases, a woman began the solution of the problem. Its ethical bearings did not enter her head. She had long worked among the poor. She knew what temptation meant, and how often an innocent girl, betrayed by a villain, needed the support denied her by the Pharisee, and even by those who wished to help, yet feared some compromising quality in the act. What thoughts went on under Sister Irene's close black bonnet, she does not tell. It is sufficient to our purpose 
that the basket was bought and that on October morning in 1869, the rain pouring as if to wash out any possible stain entailed by the act, the people in 12th Street saw in the doorway of number 17 a curious little basket softly lined and for a mysterious purpose which nobody could fathom men looked at it as they went to business and wondered if anybody had set it down and forgotten to take it in it was still there when they returned home at night and a light gleamed above it but its purpose was no plainer than when day dawned and found it there far into the night when the solitary footsteps of an occasional pedestrian echoed loudly in the silent street a frightened woman stole toward the open doorway casting startled looks around and behind her and after long crouching in the shadow softly crept up the steps something held close in her arms went with her which she pressed to her breast again and again and then with a burst of tears she laid it in the basket and silently hurried down the steps crouching again in the friendly shadow she waited her face turned toward the doorway till a baby's wail followed by a sharp little cry was heard and she half sprung up and stretched her arms toward the basket the door opened even as the cry came a woman with a calm gentle face stood for a moment the flood of light from the hall bringing out every line of face and figure, then stooped and lifted the bundle to her shoulder, pressing the little face close to her own. The baby nestled to her as she passed into the hall. The door closed, and the woman, crouching in the darkness, stole away, bearing her secret with her. Another babe was found on the stoop during the night, in spite of the rain that was falling in torrents, the next night came two women, each with her burden, which was laid in the basket, and twice again the door opened, and the black-robed figure responded to the feeble cry that had only to sound to be heard. Out of the cold and dark, into warmth and light and care, went each helpless tenant of the waiting basket, and news soon went out that here no questions were asked, no demands were made but help and comfort were always waiting within a month the number of babies reached forty-five the house was full this is the story of sister irene's little house on twelfth street the first foundling asylum in the united states never was anything on smaller scale Often she rose in the morning utterly uncertain as to where the day's food was to come from, and always before night help came and the work went on. Doubt as one might the wisdom of such undertaking, there were babies, and they must be fed. Ladies sent in food, money, and bundles of little garments, often from the drawer where they had been laid with tears, as the bereaved mother folded them away in memory of the little one who had put on angel raiment. These bereaved mothers took turns at watching, preparing food, and all the thousand cares of nursery, and Sister Irene and her nuns did the rest. Up to this time infanticide had been common, and abandonment on the streets no less so. Twenty years ago, scarcely a morning passed without its being recorded in the daily journals that the body of a newborn babe had been found floating near the docks buried in an ash barrel or flung into some lonely area each day an armful of little unfortunates picked up by the police on their night beats were carried to the almshouse on blackwell's island to be bottle fed by the aged paupers rarely surviving their infancy there was no place for these little waifs in charitable institutions for the charters did not admit them and even now with a place offering itself it was doubtful if it must not depend upon private charity for support the matter came up for consideration 
and the city fathers finally settled to pay a trifling amount per head for the baby's support. This was the beginning, and during the twenty years that have gone by since Sister Irene lifted the first tiny occupant of the basket to the motherly breast that has never known motherhood, over twenty-two thousand babies have been cared for by her and her helpers. Long ago, the Twelfth Street home proved utterly inadequate, and the great building on Lexington Avenue received them, to become in turn all too small for the crowds that apply. The main building now accommodates 600 babies and 300 mothers, and besides these, 1,200 are put out to nurse. In any poor family where a baby has died, the mother can take one of these little waifs, provided the doctor gives a certificate that the applicant is responsible and in fair health. For this the city pays $10 a month, but the woman must bring the child to the asylum once a month on the payday fixed, where it is inspected by the sisters before she receives her wage. Picture a helpless babe, a day or two old, either laid reluctantly in the crib by a poor broken-hearted mother, or abandoned pitilessly under cover of night on the steps or in the neighbourhood of the asylum. A little one entering is first registered, receiving a name and number, and is then temporarily placed in one of the nurseries. In a few days it is confided to a nurse in the outside department. Within a week her home is visited by the asylum detective to gain positive assurance that she is worthy of the trust. For the next three years the foundling is a member of its foster mother's family and is known as a rent baby. Once a month on payday she takes it to the asylum for inspection and if sick, it must be carried there for treatment. Time passes on. The baby has become a runaround and is recalled to the asylum. This time, there are bitter tears shed over the foundling by the foster mother, who declares that the little stranger brought a blessing upon her home. If it is ill, it is taken in at the hospital for treatment, and here its troubles often end. But the percentage of death is less than one would be expected and of all the mothers who serve as deputies the majority give good care and often grow so attached to their little charges that adoption follows shortly after the opening of the asylum a second branch of work until then uncontemplated forced itself upon the sister's attention one day a young woman came with her baby and pleaded not to leave it, but to be received into the house with it. As provision had been made for foundlings only, she was refused. A few hours later, the woman returned and renewed her entreaties, saying her friends had cast her off. She had no shelter for the night. Might she not remain with her child? Money was given her for her present need, but once more she was refused admission. In the evening she came again and said there was but one alternative. If the sisters would not consent to take her, she would go and destroy herself. If they allowed her to stay with her child, she would work for them and nurse another baby with her own. These last words were a revelation, for painful experience had taught that, with the most unwearied care and vigilance, it was almost impossible to raise a number of infants by hand. The babies would gain by this extension of the work, as well as the poor homeless mothers. The girl, by her own importunity, had opened a refuge for thousands who, since then, have sought the shelter of the asylum. It is a noteworthy fact that, of the many nationalities represented, Irish, French, German and Italian, it is the Italian mothers who bring back the healthiest looking babies, and under whose nursing the weaklings soonest begin to thrive. They mother them like their own, and it is mothering, or the want of it, 
that means life or death to the waifs that save for happy chance will never know the portion of real childhood in the great asylum on lexington avenue the outgrowth of sister irene's little basket she still rules the face is more than twenty years older than on that stormy night in which her basket held its first tenant but it is even more peaceful and bright her shoulders are bowed her day of work nearing its end but she cannot enter a ward but that the children tumble over each other in eagerness to even touch her and her priding them is something beautiful to see as she pauses to admire the delicate skin of one the bright eyes of another the larger babies quarrel as to which shall open the door for her or rejoice as she singles out one for special attention they learn rhymes to please her they even make no protest against the sorest of childhood trials face washing if it is to make ready for sister irene's coming and a forest of small hands wave a parting greeting as she passes through the open door there is another reminder of her beginning of this beneficent work in the marble corridors of the great building hang pictures of saints and children each one a gift and each with its special significance in the vestibule there is no longer a basket but a basinet with its pretty canopy of pink and white and it knows as many pitiful stories as the old receptacle which it long ago replaced in the long wards with their white canopied cribs one sees white-capped nurses caring for their small charges as diligently as if it were their sole thought in life it is hard to believe that they are themselves on probation proving here their repentance and desire for a better life two or three sisters are always with the babies and the larger children follow them about or are busy with the bright papers and toys of the kindergarten there are two kindergarten classes each numbering about fifty a more charming sight can hardly be imagined than that presented by these children of misfortune laughing and singing at their games or grasping in their tiny fingers the various kindergarten gifts the least observant visitor on beholding the large assemblage of older children in the full tide of enjoyment and happiness would quite forget the sad page in their history they are not in uniform that depressing fact of most asylums on the contrary each child seems to wear a different colour and the pretty locks of all are banged and tied with bright ribbons as carefully as if a mother's hand had done it one fact might be dwelt upon by all mothers these twelve hundred and more babies have the purest complexions the result of the absolute regularity with which they are fed and cared for no food is allowed between meals but not one of them goes hungry and the majority have a contented and comfortable look all nationalities are here and every shade of colouring and every type of feature and often a beauty of both feature and expression that wins all hearts at once at three years old a baby's life under sister irene's roof must end up to that age the mother may claim it if she will after that it can be legally adopted by any one though under the charge of the sisters till its majority it has been deemed best to find homes for them outside the city and an agent visits the parties applying for children to adopt and travels in the west securing homes the number of applications is large and they are of all orders one writes we want a nice little red-headed boy i have a red-haired wife and five red-headed little girls and we want a boy to match another in an order for a little brown-haired and blue-eyed girl adds she must have a pretty nose while another writes send us a smart stout saucy boy of six irish parents good tidings come from the west 
concerning the little ones who have been sent out to brighten childless homes. Some are declared to be the sweetest and dearest little children in the world. Others are the smartest in school. And one and all of the adopted parents express in different ways the same sentiment that they could not possibly get on without them. Many persons who have seen them in the care of others desire to obtain similar treasures for themselves, and the agent, during his western tours of inspection, has little difficulty in selecting homes for a band of forty or fifty, and then comes the excitement of departure. The children, all animation and eagerness at the thought of the dear papas and mamas who are at last sending for them, assemble in the playroom to be prepared for their journey. They are dressed in their neat, warm cloaks and pretty hoods by those who have been to them as loving mothers and who could scarcely bear to send them forth to an unknown future but for their confidence in him who has promised I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. The roll is called to make sure that all appointed for the journey are at hand, and then, accompanied by several sisters, the little ones are placed in the stages that are to convey them to the station. The novelty of the ride and the bustle of the depot interest and amuse them, and it is only when they are settled in the car that is to take them to their destination and the sisters turn to leave them that they realise the parting from their first friends and the journey is begun amid sobs and tears. But childish griefs are short-lived and by the time the West is reached bright little faces are peeping out anxious to catch the first glimpse of those who are eagerly awaiting them. As far as it could be expected, they have met with parental care and love, and in their innocence fondly imagine that they have found their lost father and mother. It is most affecting to behold a little troop starting for these far-off homes. In response to the question, Little one, where are you going? The reply invariably comes, to my papa and mamma. Many of them regularly correspond with Sister Irene. One wrote, Dear sister, I hope you are well, and I would like to hear from you. I am getting a big boy now, and I am nine years old. I am getting along in my books very well. Tell Mr. Hughes to send me that goat. I have a sloop, and she got frozen in the ice, and I could not hardly get her out. Goodbye. Another wrote, Dear sister, I thought I would write to you and send my report so that you can see how I am getting along in my lessons. I got the prize last month for taking the highest percent in spelling. I am beginning to save my money and I have 44 cents. I have had a real nice time this winter sliding on my sled. I am well and so is Mama. Goodbye. Mama and I send love to you, your little boy, F. Some of the children first sent out have already reached maturity and have chosen a calling. Some are happily married and often write letters showing how gratefully and affectionately they remember those who protected them in infancy. This is the sunny side of the work. There is another. The hospital. Its wards filled with disease, deformity and suffering the penalty of the parents' sins. Here are the incurables, some of whom will linger in pain and suffering year after year, but many will soon escape to the happier country, where they shall no more say, I am sick. The little faces, worn and spiritualized by suffering, are still cheerful. Every possible alleviation is there but pain rules and must rule in the tortured little bodies, which have never known any other life but suffering. Beyond these wards is the quarantine, connected with the other buildings by iron bridges, by means of which little patients sick with any contagious disease can be conveyed there without going through the other buildings. To meet the total expenses of this great work, nearly two hundred and seventy five thousand dollars a year are required 
and voluntary contributions are depended upon to a considerable extent this foundling asylum is a type of the many homes which year by year have grown up for children fifteen thousand of whom are now the charge of city or private charity there are orphan asylums of every order white and coloured catholic and protestant every hospital has its children's ward and there are special ones for every form of disease near sister irene's home is a new venture hardly five years in existence but of equal helpfulness in its way it is only one large house known as the baby's hospital and capable at its utmost of holding not over forty babies it is for the sick not for the well and gives summer outings for the severest cases none are turned away not even the dying and these come oftener than might be supposed since hard-working mothers cannot or do not stop till the last moment to attend to a baby sick or well contagious diseases are excluded but everything else is undertaken and sooner or later finds its way here every police station all the charitable associations all the mission rooms have been notified that here is a refuge for all sick children mothers are suspicious of hospitals and believe them places built for experiment upon the poor but the mother who has once had her baby under treatment here persuades all she knows to try it for their own there are a number of free cribs it costs three thousand dollars to endow a crib for one's lifetime and two hundred and fifty dollars to maintain it for a year the children of elberon where president garfield died pay this sum yearly for a crib over which their name hangs and there is one crib for which a wealthy mother gave five thousand dollars thus endowing it for ever here as in many children's wards in hospitals the real difficulty is often found to be that the babies have never been properly fed and a week or two of good food cures the supposed disease the most interesting spot in this hospital after the babies themselves each in its crib with white coverlet warm blanket and pretty blue pink or lilac puff tufted with knots of gay worsted is the kitchen where all their food is prepared here stands the great cans of milk bottles of baby food beef juice and all that baby needs require beyond is the cold room and in it stands a great case similar to a row of post office boxes one for each baby and labelled with its name in it is placed daily the food it is to have chosen after the doctor's prescription and in bottles stopped with the latest discovery baked cotton batting germs of disease being a part of the air one must breathe in the cities or indeed anywhere save on mountain tops it becomes specially necessary to guard against them in a hospital and it has been found that they cannot penetrate through baked cotton batting so baked it is and these babies have purer food than often falls to the lot of most fifth avenue children there is one scene that nightly appeals to those in charge of the homeless little ones at the five points house of industry it is repeated at other points of the great city wherever indeed rise the walls of a child's asylum or protectory but here in this first and oldest of all aids for the helpless ones it seems to have special significance and most touching appeal round about the great room with its rows of little iron cots covered with snowy white spreads the only home these tiny waifs have ever known kneel the babies of three years and upwards with folded hands eyes tight shut or opening for a moment's survey of the others the little lips repeat in unison the prayer that happy mothers in many a home bend to hear now i lay me down to sleep i pray the lord my soul to keep be sure that it is heard and that for each and all of these little ones there is a watch and ward in that kingdom 
where none may enter save as they become as little children. The new training school for children's nurses, which is intended to give thorough training to all who are to have the care of young children, has four of its students on duty here through the day, and they may even serve a term as regular nurses after their two years course is over, for this and all the other hospitals for children is a type of care impossible even a few years ago. The standard has risen year by year till now every appliance of science is brought to bear. Even the hospital for incurables furnishing its quota of experience and suggestion. There are many institutions devoted to this heavenly charity. The two I have imperfectly described are typical forms in which the passion for helpfulness and the saving of life find marked expression. But the city has other charities no less worthy and the story of any one told in full would make a volume, each page of which might well, if praise were in question, be printed in letters of gold, and bound like beautiful missiles of old, in vellum, jewel set, with all rare and costly work of monkish pens and gravers. End of chapter 19「Chapter 20 of Darkness and Daylight or Lights and Shadows of New York Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Bruce Peary. Darkness and Daylight or Lights and Shadows of New York Life. Chapter 20 by Helen Campbell. Italian life in New York, scenes in the Great Bend in Mulberry Street, homes of filth and squalor. Fully a generation ago, the children who watched from New York windows for the organ grinder and his monkey, or those more adventurous ones who followed his devious way as far as they dared, looked with wondering eyes at the monkey's close companion, a child and sometimes more than one, dark-eyed, low-browed, and swarthy, with flashing white teeth that gleamed out at the least kindness, and a grace and suppleness of movement born under other than American skies. For the most part they were melancholy little creatures, and they had good reason. Their inability to speak English, and their terror at the conditions that surrounded them, sealed their lips nor did the public awaken to the outrages committed upon them till roused by the indignation of the few who had investigated the matter to the bottom and knew whereof they spoke it was the children's aid society that first sounded an alarm and sought some means of relief for the abominations of the padroni system this meant a formal traffic hardly less well organized than the old slave system by means of which italian children were hired from parents or friends at home or came here with them to follow organ grinders and beg every child was compelled to bring home a fixed sum daily if it was exceeded good if it fell below the standard beating and starvation were the penalties children died of want cold and privation nor was there any hope of betterment till the first school for italians was opened and fought its way to recognition and final success the organ grinder was once an emblem of our idea of italian life and the recipient of all the scorn that busy practical america has for this pursuit it has gradually dawned upon us however that a man need not necessarily be a beggar who adopts organ grinding as his occupation and that he may even lead a more wholesome and broader life than that of the shoemaker at his bench or the toiler in the factory or mine often it is true the italian organ grinder represented the worst order of his countrymen he was the forerunner of the tide of emigration from italy that from that day to this has set steadily toward our shores a constantly increasing army of italians young and old drawn from the poorer and often from the most vicious classes the New York Italian colony now numbers over 70,000 souls, and is still increasing. 
it is chiefly the laboring class who come and they have proved efficient and patient workers at railroad construction and innumerable other forms of manual labor aside from this is a proportion and a constantly increasing one of professional men and merchants ninety-five per cent of all who arrive become american citizens and thirty per cent remain in new york or its immediate vicinity it was the organ grinder who first carried back the tale of what might be done in the new country and stirred uneasy longings often there was no capital available for the listening peasant save that in tessa's heavy gold beads but she sold them willingly for passage money firm in the faith that better ones would soon take their place if they owned a little patch of land it was sold or sometimes leased and the two turned their faces westward one may see the type to-day giovanni in leggings broad hat and blue jacket and tessa with her heavy braids and gay flowered shawl just landed at castle garden and looking with serious eyes at the new surroundings the elevated road is the first amazement and a terror as well till custom has dulled the first shock at seeing trains in the air but for the first few days all is wonder from whatever part of italy they come they bring alike the melancholy faces that are part of the italian inheritance they are fatalists long oppression unending hard work and grinding poverty have all left their lines we think of all italians as happy easy-natured do-nothings and for naples and much of southern italy this is in part true but northern italians have much in common with new englanders they are abstinent frugal hard-working and patient but a little prosperity soon alters the expression and brings out the underlying type let us begin with the lowest order the dealer in fruit and vegetables or the rag picker who gravitates at once to the region given over to his people here one finds them swarming in the great tenement houses grouping on doorsteps and sidewalks and forming with their vivid coloring their flashing eyes and gay-colored raiment one of the most picturesque scenes new york has to offer do they herd together yes but no more or perhaps less than at home as anyone who has been in genoa for instance and watched the stream of humanity pouring out from the tall old houses of the carmagiano district can testify they were not paupers even there though many affirm that whoever prefers macaroni and oil to baker's bread must be near that condition but they live on what an american would find impossible and thus lay up money even when earnings are scantiest take the great bend in mulberry street on a saturday morning a spot as utterly un-american as anything in new york the open-air market is going on and trucks and barrows of every description line the sidewalk a never-ending throng through which one can barely make way fills every available foot of walk tainted meat poultry blue with age and skinny beyond belief vegetables in every stage of wiltedness fruit half rotten or mouldy butter so rancid that it poisons the air eggs broken in transit sold by the spoonful for omelettes fish that long ago left the water all contribute their share to the unbearable odor that even in the open air proves almost too much for endurance over and over again the board of health officers have swooped down on the bend and dumped the contents of the entire market into the river but they cannot always be at hand and so buying and selling goes on great sacks lie along the walk they hold bread the rejected stock of the downtown baker who allows it to accumulate till hard dry or mouldy according to the weather and the place of storage it is sold at so much a sackful and the inhabitants of the bend walk away with their selections as content apparently as if it had come fresh from the oven at one point sits an old woman wrinkled and skinny as her stock in trade and holds out a starved little turkey as customers pause for consideration 
una bella polina a beautiful hen turkey she cries with a thousand adjectives expressive of the fine qualities of this desirable investment and presently a young woman after a fierce course of bargaining accompanied with wild gestures that seem to point to nothing less than bloodshed counts out the price grasps her prize and moves on smilingly buyer and seller vociferate and grimace and he or she who can talk longest and loudest wins in the end the piles of unwholesomeness and actual disease rapidly diminish even sometimes disappear altogether before the crowd of eager buyers and the throng lessens it is the sunday's supply and presently there will be a smell of cooking and herbs and oil will destroy rankness and make of the unsavory ingredients a meal which the purchasers will count festivity the homes in these houses are of all orders some squalid and filthy others clean and bright with red and blue saints on the walls and gay patchwork quilts on the bed they all love lilac a reminder to them of the orange blossoms of their sunny native land and in the season one may see many a bunch placed on a little shelf or bracket before the patron saint the organ grinder may even bring home a bunch on his return from a round he loves flowers also and delights in bringing them back to the children down on baxter street is a cluster of eight houses known as the beehive and here is a man who is organ renter and clock seller the business managed in part by his wife the organ grinder seldom owns his organ and hardly ever his monkey this same beehive has another tenant who trains monkeys and one who has long been organ mender the double house close at hand swarms with neapolitans who are chiefly organ grinders and fruit sellers and here is a monkey trainer who for a small consideration will show his pets a well-trained organ monkey is worth from twelve to twenty dollars and the trainer works patiently to give them the necessary accomplishments bowing holding out the cap for money and so forth they are taught to obey the word of command in both italian and english the whip being employed as argument but as little as possible a dozen solemn-eyed monkeys were in the cage when i called upon them and the youngest a mere baby of a monkey screamed for joy as the door was opened and he was allowed to come out for a little he was but half trained the others watched the master's eye and chattered comments among themselves while a child stood gravely by watching their antics this is the region of rag pickers and in cellars basements and alleys as well as in many a room of the tenement houses the work of sorting goes on bones and garbage of many kinds are often added to the rags and here again the board of health interferes as far as possible a thousand people dwell in the beehive and most of them of the lowest order yet there are few beggars and the majority work hard each day they give up the open-air eating that formed part of their european home life nor do they take as many saints days for holidays the new york passion for money is upon them and they work out of these noisome surroundings into something better in surprisingly short spaces of time the members of the class just above them the thrifty bourgeois make money as grocers hairdressers or barbers and go back to their native land to astonish old neighbors with their gains often such a one returns to new york and to the same quarters for the sake of adding to his store finding that the old life has lost its charm and that his days must end in america there is yet another class the chorus singers and ballet dancers in the spectacular drama and the opera companies they with merchants and professional men frequent the italian restaurants some of which are famous nothing has done more to make the italian immigrant contented with new york than the industrial schools which are thronged by the children 
a pair who had landed at castle garden at six were found in line at nine the same morning and announced that seven others would be there in the afternoon they know from others just what is provided for them and use every opportunity the great school on leonard street the outgrowth of the little seed planted in eighteen fifty five holds five hundred of them afternoon and night schools take in the most pupils since many must earn their support during the day the boys are taught various trades the girls learn sewing lace making and so forth the building has schoolrooms bathrooms reading rooms and printing offices where trades are taught and payment given for work that is done some stay away at intervals or attend irregularly because they must mind the stand or help to sort rags but all are anxious to come often they graduate from this into the public school and hundreds of good citizens owe their success to teachings received here the story of the school is, like that of many another invaluable work for children in New York, a part of the record of the Children's Aid Society. The first Italian emigrants were chiefly a part of the padroni system, and necessarily the lowest order of that nationality. Some 1,500 settled in and about the five points, to which that type still gravitates but they were not criminals and they lived hard-working lives shut off by their ignorance of english from much share in the life about them suspicion and distrust had been born of this isolation and thus it was hard to make them believe that a school could be opened with no ulterior design below the seeming help three years of constant effort were required before any real foothold was gained the ardent opposition of one of their priests being the greatest obstacle he threatened excommunication for all who allowed their children to enter the heretic doors and went from house to house to supplement the curse given in church fortunately he collected money for a school according to his own ideas and then decamped preferring to spend it at his leisure on his own soil this was the turning point for the people made amends by sending their children to the school he had denounced from this time on the growth of the school has been steady the chief object was to cultivate self-respect and turn the children from begging and organ grinding towards trades and this has been accomplished most thoroughly the maestro has become a most indispensable personage and is assumed to be not only a teacher but lawyer doctor theologian astronomer banker everything that is good and desirable family quarrels are brought before him for adjustment and the gratitude of the people is unending compensation for the service rendered the italian government through its minister in the united states has sent formal thanks for the benefits extended to its people and the higher class of italians in new york are doing their full share toward helping on the work italians born in this country are much lighter in complexion than those born under an italian sun they pass for americans and wish to for they are sometimes made to feel that their nationality is a disgrace they enter every trade the girls are dexterous and skillful workers and many are found in artificial flower factories in one of these factories near canal street an old carbonaro spends his days in stamping patterns for flowers a gray-headed eagle-eyed old man a patriot and companion of garibaldi there are many of the same order but they work as quietly as garibaldi himself worked at his trade of sail making while in this country in the region known as little italy many of the most evil and reckless have banded but they are a company less to be dreaded than our own hoodlums they stab it is true and steal and perform other undesirable offences but they are not as lost in degradation and often after a course of this sort of vicious indulgence they reform and take to hard work 
the colony has nearly eighty benevolent societies several weekly papers and a chamber of commerce supported in part by the italian government it is intended to establish an italian home and then the immigrants will fare much better than at present swindlers are always on the watch to defraud them and there is constant complaint that the bosses are often as much at fault italian banks are started in the neighborhood of their work and presently the cashier disappears with their savings but all this is mending the consuls under the direction of king umbert and the italian government are paying special attention to the immigrant and to the condition of all italians in this country and there is much testimony to their teachableness they make a city of their own and are one more element in the strange mosaic we call new york where every nationality is coming to have larger place than the stock which has the best right to claim it as home End of chapter twenty